All right, good evening. Uh, welcome to the Township Committee meeting, uh, October 5th, 2020. This is via Zoom remote access, uh, starting at 7 p.m. at the Municipal Building for Delanco, 770 Cooperstown Road. Uh, roll call, please, Mrs. Lohr. Mr. Brown. Present. Ms. Fitzpatrick. Here. Ms. Holland. Here. Mr. Olette. Here. Mr. Templeton. And here, also present, Mr. Schwab, our township administrator, Mr. Fox, our township engineer, Mr. Heinhold, our township solicitor, Mrs. Laura, municipal clerk, um, Mrs. Martin, I believe I saw Katie on. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Deputy municipal clerk, uh, Mr. Fenimore has not appeared yet, uh, Chief Chessie DeSanto, and we also have Aaron Provenzano assisting with the technical aspects. Have I missed anyone? I think I got them all. Uh, dispense with the flag salute in this environment. Sean, Mrs. Laura, sunshine statement and the remote access uh, notices. Yes, the sunshine statement or the um, adequate meeting notice. Please be advised that proper notice of this meeting has been given in compliance with the Open Public Meetings Act in the following manner. Written notice has been mailed to the Burlington County Times and Courier Post and published in the December 27, 2019 editions. Written notice has been posted on the official bulletin board of the Township of Delanco at least 48 hours prior to the meeting. Remote access meeting uh, notice is please take notice that in accordance with the Open Public Meetings Act, NJSA 10 colon 4-6 and in consideration of executive order numbers 103, 104 and 107 issued, issued by Governor Murphy declaring a state of emergency and a public health emergency in the state of New Jersey. The Township of Delanco does hereby notify the public that to protect the health, safety, and welfare of our citizens while ensuring the continued functioning of government, the meeting of the Delanco Township Committee scheduled for October 5th, 2020 is available via electronic format for members of the public who wish to participate in the meeting remotely. Um, the public may participate via remote access um, as follows with various login information for uh, telephone, uh, computer login credentials. New, uh, new requirement is a remote public meeting statement. Advanced public comments. Advanced public comments will be accepted via written letter or electronic mail. All advanced comments must be received no later than six hours prior to the commencement of the published public meeting start time. All advanced public comments must be submitted to the municipal clerk's email at jlaw.delancotownship.com or to the municipal clerk's attention at 770 Coopertown Road, Delanco, New Jersey, 08075. Public comments submitted before the remote public meeting deadline will be read aloud during the remote public meeting. Procedures for making comments and muting function during the remote meeting public comment sessions. Members of the public who wish to make comments or have questions during the meeting public comment sessions may either make their comments or questions via audio option or by typing their comment or question via the Zoom platform chat option uh, to all the participants, not to a specific participant. Members of the public who are deemed to be disruptive as defined by NJAC 5 colon 39-1 may be muted after an initial warning for the duration of the public comment session and or remainder of the remote meeting session. Agenda document. The agenda for this remote meeting is available on the Delanco Township website www.delancotownship.com backslash comment backslash 5298 backslash 5876 default.aspx. Um, that, that's all brand new as required by the new um, administrative executive order through administrative code 5 colon 39 1. Mayor. Thank you. You have anything to elaborate on that or to explain in detail or? We talked about some cutoff times for the public comment written notices. Yeah, the, the new notice, if we're having any um, uh, meeting via a Zoom platform, we have to give um, the public an opportunity to, to submit advanced public comments. And those are due no later than six hours prior to the commencement of the published um, meeting start time, in this case, 7 p.m and they can be received to the email of the municipal clerk uh, or to um, via mail sent to the municipal clerk, clerk or drop, dropped off at the township okay. building. Thank you. <clears throat> we also have to let people know where they can access the agenda, which we did in number three. 
And we also have to explain the uh, procedure for making um, uh, comments or asking questions, which is um, number two. And that can be done during the audio, uh, uh, audio function, or people can use the chat function here at Zoom, which is the bubble type thing. It says chat. And then um, when the meeting is open to the public, the first session you'll see later, the first session is going to be for these advanced comments. Um, and then also people will be able to either, uh, will be unmuted, will be able to ask their questions through audio or uh, type them in via chat. Okay. Hopefully that explained it. Very good. Yeah, a lot, lot to cover there. Uh, thank you for repeating so much of that. And, uh, um, in this new environment, we want to be able to entertain and receive as much or all available public comment. All right, let's get rolling. Um, Ordinance 2020-13, amending the Township Code at Chapter 216 governing park regulations with regard to waterfront regulations. This is the second reading by title only and public hearing on this item. Uh, hearing is now open to the public for Ordinance 2020-13. Do I have any comments from the public or the committee on this uh, proposed ordinance. So actually, Aaron, we have to make sure that the public is unmuted so that they have any questions. And of course, if they wanted to type in a question via chat, they could do that also. They'll need to, uh, if they want to speak, they can unmute themselves or um, I could go through. I would have to ask them to unmute, but if anybody wants to speak, they'll have to unmute. Now, Aaron, you're you're monitoring the chat box. Uh, yep. Okay. Yes. No we're, chats at this moment. We just want to ensure that that's being monitored. So I think it's important, Mayor, at this point, for <coughs> excuse me, the public hearing on this ordinance to announce that anyone that has any comments or questions, make sure that they are unmuted, um, and um, just state their name and address before they um, ask their question or uh, or make their comment. Does anyone have any question or comment regarding ordinance 2020-13 uh, amending park regulations? The second reading, this is now open to the public. Are there any written chat comments or any, were there any uh, comments sub submitted today? Nothing, Mayor. Okay. All right, hearing is now closed to the public. Um, may I have a motion please for ordinance 2020-13? Move. Motion by Ms. Holland. A second, please. I'll second. Second by Mr. Olette. Roll call, please. Mr. Brown. Yes. Mrs. Patrick. Yes. Ms. Holland. Yes. Mr. Olette. Yes. Mr. Templeton. Yes. Thank you. And We're thank you all. Down. The chief. Uh, Mr. Heinhold and everyone's participation and input on sorting this uh, modification to 213 or two, chapter 216. Uh, public comment statement. Purpose of the public comment session is to allow residents to share information and or views with the Delanco Township Committee. Since the committee may be hearing the information for the first time, it is not always possible to have issues and questions settled within the public comment session. Uh, advanced remote meeting comments and questions. This section is to acknowledge and read those comments and questions received by the municipal clerk in advance of the remote meeting, either by electronic email or written letter as required by NJAC 5-139-1 at Sequitter. Members of the public participating live in this meeting will be given the opportunity for comments and questions during the meeting in one or both of the following public comment sessions. Microphones of the public participants will be unmuted for the live public comment sessions. Uh, the meeting is open to the public for comments and questions, session one. And the first section is via live audio or type to chat um, uh, function. And for the advanced remote meeting, for the record, I received no advanced uh, written comments or questions for the meeting. So I'll just mark that, that's new. So the second part of this, because um, this is all new, is that anyone that is participating in this live in the meeting live would now um, unmute uh, and state their name and address, uh, or can participate via the the chat function. 
So the meeting is open to the public for those that are participating live for their comments and questions. I wanna make sure everybody's unmuted. So right now we do have members of the public that are participating, they are muted. So if they have comments or questions, they need to unmute. Hi, Janice, Matt Bartlett, 1800 Second Street. I have a, hi, Matt. hi. Good to see everyone. I have a rather long comment. If you guys prefer, I could save it to the second period or we could go through it now. Well, get it out there. And if it looks like it's something we need to come back to, we'll, we'll do that. All right. Thank you, Mike. I uh, just want to say, uh, Matt, yep. Did you say your address? I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm sorry. Uh, 1800 Second Street, Delanco. Okay, thank you, Matt. No problem. Just want to uh, start off by saying I love living in Delanco. Um, as a lot of you know, I moved here in 2005 from New York, put down roots, loved its small town charm where everyone knows each other's name and looks out for each other. Uh, uh, invested heavily in the community monetarily with uh, houses I bought, investment properties, my commercial property on Burlington Ave, and invested heavily with my time uh, serving the community as all of you have putting hundreds of hundreds of hours in between the joint land use board, the historic board, uh, fire, EMS, DISA, et cetera. Um, my wife and I decided a few months ago to move houses uh, to something that would better suit our family's needs. And there was no doubt we were gonna stay here in Delanco, which we have. Um, all that being said, I'm incredibly disappointed in our land use procedures and the madness that is ensuing just so I could have my commercial property rented. Uh, as you guys know, my office slash warehouse slash garage, it's located at 738 Burlington, uh, right diagonally from the 7-Eleven, the corner of Hazel, it's in the C2 zone. Bought it five years ago, relocated my business from the watch case in Riverside. I bought rehab that dilapidated building, everything literally falling off the walls there. Uh, it's a historic building. It's been in the uh, town since the 1920s, our first town garage, uh, not, not the township garage, but like a garage uh, to fix automobiles. Um, it's been a piano repair facility, Corvette repair facility, Corvettes East, as some of you guys may remember from the 80s, uh, plumbing supply shop in my business. Um, 2016, I went before the land use board to allow my warehouse to be used as storage. As ridiculous as that seems, having to do that to use a warehouse as storage, spend tens of thousands of dollars between the board's professionals, my professionals, and the uh, conditions that the land use boards professionals placed on the application. Uh, with COVID and all, our offices shut down. My partner and I have been working from home and we really have no plans on moving back in. And I put the space up in the building for lease as I obviously have to uh, pay the mortgage on the building still. Um, I had immediate interest from Cindy Randall, who a lot of you may know, uh, she has Delanco roots as well, and she wanted to use the office space uh, for offices for her rescue, uh, her animal rescue, Randall's Rescues, uh, which places abandoned um, animals with families. My first question to her, as an animal lover, of course, you're not planning on uh, kenneling any animals in here, are you? Nope, she would just wanted to use office space. A uh, place for her volunteers to meet and do animal adoptions and whatnot. Seemed logical. We're using the office space. Told her no problem. We start to work on our lease agreement, and then I just checked our land use ordinance to confirm there's no issue that, as it should be, since an office is an office is an office. And because her organization's a nonprofit, for some reason our ordinance that the committee adopted in 2003 it requires a conditional use approval. Uh, not only that, because the ordinance has conditions for conditional use approval for nonprofits, uh, it must be at least three acres in the C2 or C3 zone, and that leaves only one place in uh, Delanco for a nonprofit, which happens to be the marshland next to Living Springs out on 130, which is owned by the state. And, you know, for a town that runs on nonprofits such as Fire, the Squad, DISA, the Women's Club, et cetera, you have no place for a nonprofit in this town. With that being said, you need a variance to keep it in town. I, I figured that had to be a mistake, it was, had to be reading the ordinance wrong. You know, so I talked to Richard, I talked to some of you, I talked to Pete, the zoning officer. No one had any idea why using an office would require a conditional use, costing hundreds in application fees, thousands in escrow. 
and many months of time, but Pete confirmed, yes, that the town is indeed requiring this to be a conditional use approval to use the office. And uh, he said he had confirmed that with Doug and it made no sense to anyone, but apparently that's what the town is sticking with. Uh, there's a dozen or so businesses I could put in here without having to go to the board, such as a funeral home, a restaurant, an office for any sort of professional. I could even put a dry cleaner or an adult daycare here and even a dressmaker or a cobbler. We could operate as outdated as those terms are, but because her nonprofit is taxed as a nonprofit, it's not allowed. And she can't afford the money for just all these fees to go before the board, so she can move in here. Over the last week, I had two people actually reach out to me interesting, interested in using the uh, garage for auto work. One guy who stopped by uh, at the building while I was having my yard sale there uh, a couple Saturdays ago, he has a small car detailing business he does on the side. And another guy who buys cars at the auto auction for hobbies, fixes them up and sells them online. But sure enough, our zoning code doesn't cover using the garage as a garage, something it was for a century. And actually my resolution to use the warehouse as a warehouse put a restriction on that no cars could be worked on in the garage, which I didn't even realize till I was looking at it this afternoon as that was never talked about even in front of the board. So I need again to go back to the board spending hundreds and thousands. And I'll cut to the chase right here. My point is we're gonna end up with yet another empty building in town because we can't get out of our own why, uh, our own way. I hear everyone say how business unfriendly we are and I never really thought about that until it directly affects me now and I could see how firsthand it really is. We've done a great job filling our empty buildings on Burlington Avenue with uh, Lou DeLova putting in the deli, Frank Long opening the ice cream shop and uh, Leah's opening the bake shop in the old Dayton building, you know, which is great, but you as a committee need to take action. I don't know if there's anything you could do about this, but it's bigger than me. You know, we can't survive without rateables. Little guys like me, we are still rateables. You know, DR Horton's development that's getting built, they're not going to make the town money. We give over, you know, we bend over backwards giving deals to the big guys, pilot after pilot to Deeds and Watson and Stanker and Galetto. Meanwhile, my taxes are going up on an empty building, $300 this year. You know, I look forward to see how the committee can make things right with our land use procedures. In these changing times, we need to adapt to change. And by milking businesses and nonprofits who want to make Delanco their home, certainly isn't a way to do it. Thank you. Thanks, Matt. Thanks for the um, detailed history of, uh, of what, you, what you've got and, and, and on the building and the property. Um, Richard or Kitty or Janice, uh, uh, is there, as far as the, the, the code, that applies to Matt's tenant and not and not to Matt specifically as the owner of the property. Is that, is there, or is there some way that that uh, can fit in there or? Well, I'm actually looking at um, our code 110-36 is the C2 downtown commercial district where this property is located. And it's, 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 any zone, any code um, has permitted uses. Right. Um, but my, my point is Matt, Matt himself is not a nonprofit. He's the owner of the property. It's not, yeah, but it's, it's not a nonprofit it's, entity that owns that, that building, that property. But it's a, what the building, the property is used for. That's the use. Okay. Um, so whether I'm it is- like, there. <laughs> I know, I know, I know. I have I have my deputy zoning officer hat on right now. <laughs> and we looked at this extensively, um, several of us to make sure it was being interpreted correctly that we were all on board. And unfortunately, uh, the C2 zone is quite clear in its permitted uses. Its principal permitted uses are very specific. And there's nothing that allows just a general office uh, use. It has to be related to, um, you know, a, a the, the professional, the attorney, accountant, insurance broker, an artist studio, and on and on. Um, the, um, so the, the permitted uses are very, very specific to the C2 zone. Well, um, it seems that that was the crafted to be very specific and to protect the, the, the residential community that's, that's hard by, I mean, is, is next door. 
again, I when this was this was in two thousand four, I believe right. this ordinance was done that put the this yeah. uh, language and these permitted uses in place. I um, don't wasn't a member of the board, the planning board back then. I don't know what the deliberations were as they were. Um, uh, doing the master plan at this process, which then generated this this ordinance. Yeah. Uh, when you look at the conditional uses, again, Matt is 100% correct. Yeah. We looked at it over and over. For some reason, the uh, conditional use uh, categorizes uh, a nonprofit as a conditional use as long as they have extensive uh, square footage. Yeah. Um, we speculated as to why that was written like that. Um, to me, I got. We think it has to do with making sure there's adequate parking, um, which, again, along the Burlington Avenue, I don't think that there's any property along Burlington Avenue that could provide that square footage. Well, it also um, seems that along Burlington Avenue, if you're establishing a commercial a C, a commercial zone, that you want to maximize your, the rateables that you can get in that zone, and if you've got a nonprofit that is occupying valuable rateable space, you'd rather give that uh, give up that land uh well in a town that you that can accept that you know yeah, in, limited commercial space in town right in the case where um the property would be rented to a nonprofit, um then it would not be tax exempt because of it's a income property True. the owner is not the nonprofit. if the nonprofit were to purchase the property and then establish you know their business then they would be, uh, I don't want to say eligible, but it could be conceivable that they could get non, um, a tax exempt status uh, as a, um, a nonprofit. But again, that's not my expertise. But in this case, we have it being rented. So therefore, it would not fall into tax exempt. And Doug, please correct me if I'm incorrect yeah, on, that, on that. That's right. It's still looked at as an income producing property. So we look at it as. Um, more in terms of the ownership and the rent that they receive as opposed to the nonprofit operating there. But I, I do, I think one of the things that Mike just pointed out is might be the thought process of why this was put into place, which is when you're establishing a commercial zone, if um, what you want is the synergy as much as possible of a lot of commercial uses together so that when somebody comes to one place uh, maybe they have reason to stop at another. And the more places that you have for people to stop, the more likely you're, you are to get um, customers and viability out of that zone. So that that's all I can think of. It's probably the best reason or only reason that I can come up with as to why this was set out as a conditional use as opposed to being a permitted use in the zone. Right. So the other I, aspect- I have a question. Um, because it seems like everybody's pretty much explained what can and cannot be used there. What can we do to change it? Because if there was going to be a church at Dayton at one time, uh, before the pie lady, uh, the, the pied out is going to be there. What can we do to, to allow Matt to rent this to a nonprofit? I mean, I think that's what's on the table here. Uh, Forget why it was done. We, I think we need to make something happen here. This is uh, unfortunate. Uh, and as Matt, he put in a lot of money in that building. And boy, that was an eyesore in Delanco for a number of years. And uh, Matt, I want to thank you for what you did. Um, it certainly has improved the area. And I think that as a member of the township committee, I would like to move forward to correct it so he can rent that to a nonprofit. Uh, if um, if a nonprofit was going to buy or rent Dayton's little building down there and put a church, I can't see why Matt can't rent this to a nonprofit. I, I don't get it. I think we need to change the zoning. That's, that's... he should have been issued a. Uh, a variance or something. Well, we already know what the what the federal provisions are for a religious organization occupying a building or property. So that's not okay. something we have any. That one don't go there. So, yeah. um, I have a little history I can add, maybe. Please. Okay, in 2003, I was the mayor, and uh, we were being inundated with, uh, you know, affordable housing. Mend is uh, next door. Um, 
you know, Catholic Charities was across the street. So there had to be some logic behind the land use board and their master plan that we didn't want to inundate Burlington Avenue with nonprofit. Now it is unfortunate that this uh, small business, uh, this rescue business falls under nonprofit, uh, but it is a conditional use, I believe. So unfortunately, uh, the applicant would have to apply to the board. Um, but before we just go ahead and say, hey, let's change it, I really think we need to consider, uh, you know, what the purpose of the, no what, what the reasoning was not letting a nonprofit organization operate. Uh, I'm not totally familiar, but I do know that the affordable housing issue was at stake, uh, as was Catholic Charities, of which people complained constantly uh, about that um, business being there. If I may, John, it, you got a you got a good building, Matt. I mean, if you're discouraged about losing a tenant, you know, you'll get another one. I, well, I, I have know. another one, John, but the problem is that tenant isn't a permitted use either. Using a garage as a garage, you know, we, we have nothing in our code that anyone is looking to do. You know, when um, I went before the board to use the warehouse, the uh, land use board to use the warehouse as storage, you know, they didn't want uh, anything besides storage in the warehouse and specifically put in my resolution, I can't have a contractor who wants to store materials there, um, you know, have his start and end of the day there with his guys to come pick up their stuff, go to job sites. Even that was a condition of the board, you know, so, <clears throat> excuse me, there's nothing that, you know, anyone wants um, that's permitted. You know, I, I, if you could find, if you could find me a dressmaker or a cobbler who may want to, you know, use the warehouse, the office space up there, that'd be great. Or if you know any restaurants well, or a jeweler, are you, perhaps. Are you subdividable there? Do you take that garage space and make separate units without going before the board for a, a variance on that, Matt? Well, I wouldn't need to subdivide the building. I, I already have approval for the um, two, um, uh, what's called principal uses. One is the office space and one is the warehouse space, but the warehouse resolution says we can only store things there, can't do anything else and I can't have a guy fix a car there because somehow that snuck in the resolution even though that was never even talked about at the meeting and this is the time when I was actually on the land use board I, I remember these in detail but these these uses can go before the land use board correct the, including Randall's rescue they they can go well it's a you, and ask, you, you you are correct it's a conditional use but, but the problem is our ordinance makes it so we can't meet any of the conditional use um, requirements without seeking a conditional use variance because we have a minimum uh, lot uh, size of 125,000 square feet, which there is no lot sizes in a C2 zone of 125,000 square feet. That's almost three acres. The, and the only place in town where it's permitted as a conditional use would be in, uh, like I said, the marshland out on 130 by Living Springs. And you know when the ordinance was crafted, it may, have, it may have had good intentions at heart, but when you have an ordinance that allows uh, conditional use in a C2 and a C3 zone, that makes conditions that it can't really be done in the C2 or C3 zone except for one location, you know, it's pushing things out of town, and it's it's an ordinance that doesn't uh, seem to meet its intent. Matt, let's. Uh the committee and our professionals and we'll talk to some of the planning board folks and see if there's a way out of this this uh, jam or not and uh we'll um we'll see what we can do or or, or you know what 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 the feeling is but let's we're not going to solve this tonight right away and uh, uh so i'll get our heads together and see if we can figure out a way to uh um all the work that you've put in there that that's you know you get something out of it that's it's useful and functional and, and a benefit and to, for the community so um we'll we'll get back to you and we'll see what uh, what we can come up with if anything all, all right. right so i could ask mike and you know like i said it's bigger than just me it's oh yeah, we're, yeah. we all sit on do nonprofit stuff with the town and i think just Very as true. a Whole, it's if let's just say I'm, I'm the treasurer of Dysa. If I wanted to Dysa to use that as their offices, we got really big and all these yeah. you know kids and everything can't do that because you know it's nonprofit and it's just it's just not right. I, th I think you understand 
why it why it is the way it is, and let's see if that feeling and that that intent is still valid uh, 17 years later. So, and we'll see what we can do. Thank you, thank you for bringing that up and uh, and uh, all the work you did on the building and all the detail you presented us with tonight. So appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. I'm sorry that I was long winded with everything, but I no, 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 are important. No. We need to hear, get educated. Very, very well stuff. presented, Matt. Very well. Thanks. Yeah. 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 Very well, Matt. Thank you. Thank you, Kate. Have a good night, everyone. I'll be on mute. We're still in the public comment session. Any other comments or uh, questions for the committee, please? If you wish to make a comment or question during the session, you will need to unmute yourself mm. and state your name and address. Thank you. Anything coming in on the chat? I see nothing, Aaron. Nothing on the chat. Okay, all right, we'll close this uh, first session for public comment, close meeting close to the public. Comments and reports, uh, professionals. Uh, let's see, Harry, do you wanna go first? Sure, sure, thank you, Mayor. Um, I, I believe you all have my, my status report for the month. Um, so I'll just go over the, the key points as usual. Um, the uh, 2020 DOT local aid, as well as the 2020 road program, uh, those plans have been approved by the state and we are, we advertise for bids on those, we're accepting bids on October 15th. And if all, everything comes in um, appropriate, then we can award on the October 19th meeting if, if you're holding that meeting. Um, what we have in there is since it's towards the end of the year, we put in the uh, specifications that's contracted. If, if weather permits, they have to, to get it done. But if weather is not favorable, they have until uh, March to, to finish the actual paving. So we don't run into digging up the street and leaving it open over the winter time. Um, that gives us a couple of advantages. If we get the bids now, we, we know exactly what we're dealing with money wise. Um, and also how the contracts work um, for asphalt and fuel prices. If the prices go down, um, we get a credit from the contractor from what he bid on them. If they go up, it costs us more. And, that, and that's just typical for any contract that's, that's by, by law. Um, so we're not taking a risk per se. If, if the prices go down, we, we come out ahead. Mm -hmm. um, so it, it, again, it lets us know kind of where we stand and we get started on the project with concrete work done now. And, and, and if the weather looks like it's going to be favorable, maybe we get one of the streets done. Um, but if not, we, we can certainly finish in the spring. For that, for that work, what's your uh, duration? Uh, 10 days, two weeks? For the concrete work or? Yeah. Or yeah the concrete work would be two weeks. That, that's not a problem. That should be no problem getting that work done. Um, and then depending on the contractor on their schedule, we'll also get much better bid prices because the contractor now can fit his these projects into his schedule. Yeah. So if he needs a street to do, we have the short section of uh, spruce. Uh, he can come in and pop that out easily before yeah. you know, there's a weather issue. Yeah, the, 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 want to avoid the situation where we've got someone that starts work and then it's yep. diverted on another job someplace else and we've got an open street where and then the weather comes in and, and now we had good days but they were out they were out of town yep and I'd just like to get get it done uh in one shot if that's possible okay all right um yeah. we have uh, several uh trainees projects um the next one that actually is going out to, to bid is the um, Hickory Street over where it, where it floods all the time over on the other side of Coopertown. Um, that section of pipe is, is all deteriorated and it's collapsing. The road's actually caving in some places. So we're replacing that pipe with, with steel pipe, ductile iron pipe. And also over by the school on Chestnut Street, uh, they have the same situation there. There's, there's no cover on the pipe. And there's also a, a large tree there with tree roots getting into the pipe and blocking it up. So we're replacing that pipe. Um, those two projects, again, we're going out to bid. They've been advertised, so we're going out to bid um, on the 15th to receive bids. And again, if, it, if favorable, we'll, like, we can award those on the 19th uh, uh, meeting. 
Um, the next uh, project we have is the Robbins Lane Ditch. That's the one over by Magnolia. Um, we do have the plans done for that, the survey. Uh, we have, uh, John and I discussed it and then looked at it out in the field and, and we have a, a plan that the best we can do with that. There's, there's only so much you can do. I mean, they live on the river, they're in the floodplain, yeah. but, but we have a plan on doing the, you know, the, the best we can do on that. I believe the bids will come in under the bid threshold. Um, so we could, once the plan is done, which they should be done this week, we can get proposals and then make a decision on that, whether we want to move forward or, or not. Okay. Is the plan to make, basically make that head wall um, non-permeable? I mean, no. No, that, that, that has to be permeable. It was designed that way. Um, reason being, that, that drainage area is huge. It takes yeah. half the town. Um, not an exaggeration, but it takes a large area. Yeah. Um, and it was, the, the pipes would be too small if that was a solid head wall. Uh, that whole area would flood from stormwater yeah. if that head wall wasn't permeable. So that's acting as a, as a large conduit built the way it is with, with the Cajun mm -hmm. investors. Um, so we really we can't make that solid. You can't make it solid and put a put a flapper valve or floodgate on 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 the river side of that. We do. We actually have a flight that flap valve on mm -hmm. the on the river side of that a duck bill valve. Um, but again, that pipe is is too small. I believe it's a twenty four maybe thirty inch pipe. Yeah. Um, and it would not hold the stormwater. If that was blocked off completely, it, it, it would not hold the stormwater. It would, it would back up. When the tide comes in, it's already at, at near the top of that head wall there. And yep. being being kind of a Gabby on construction, it you know the, the the tide just comes filtering through basically. And and it works both ways. It flows in and it flows yeah, out. Yeah. Um, you, you really can't block that off or, or the stormwater is going to be a problem. Yeah. The, the tide, you can solve the tide problem, but when you have a storm, it's going to yeah. fill that, that basin up. And I'm just, I'm just, out. I'm just the mayor this year. I can't solve the tide. I can't stop the tide. <laughs> I, I, I hear you. I know. I, I wish you could. Question for Robin's Lane. Uh, what is mm -hmm. the plan? Are they going to clean it out because there's a lot of debris in there? Um, because actually when the, tide comes in when it's a hot sometimes when it's a really high tide it actually comes over the wall um so that the problem is is that there's not enough space for the water because of all the debris that accumulates it's almost like a basin that fills in yes that that's correct kate um yeah the water does come over the wall and we put a fence on that to stop the debris from coming in uh, but the plan is yes to, to clean out the bottom of the basin the, the basin was designed with, with stone on the bottom of it. Right. Um, and that has all silted in uh, right. really bad. Uh, so we're right. going to clean out the bottom of the basin and we're going to put a little berm on, on the side of it, um, on the residential side, to stop the high tide from coming in from our area going into the, to the neighbor's yard. Right. Um, so, so that's the plan. And, and we're looking at um, possibly taking down, there's three or four trees that contribute to the silting in because they're, they're constantly dropping leaves and debris and everything right. that, into that basin area. And the uh, one neighbor, her landscaping company was filling in the area with their um, debris as well. Yep. So that, I hope that is corrected. That's, um, yeah, we are going to address all that. We're going to dress up, like I said, we're going to be digging at the bottom of it and taking that debris and building a berm next to it. Okay. Um, so that area will be all cleaned up and, and it's the best we can do. We can make the, the water flow basically as, as, as best as we can. Um, other than that, like I said, we're, you're in the floodplain. It's, you know, right. it's what it is. I understand. But that, that will be an improvement for sure. Thank you, Harry. Yeah. Okay. You're welcome. Any other questions on that one? Okay. Um, we also have uh, the, uh, talking about flat valves. At the end of uh, Poplar, where it hits Mancocus, uh, there's, a, there's an outflow pipe. And that takes the drainage all the way from Hickory Street, where the flooding problem is. Um, it comes all the way across Cooperstown, down Hickory to Poplar, all about to. Um, that, um, that whole system is, believe it or not, the inlet on Hickory Street by the ball field is lower than the high tide level. 
So when the tide comes in on a flood, on a flood tide, when a flood tide comes in, a full moon tide, um, it backs all the way up the, the, the pipe and comes out of the inlet. Uh, so we're going to be putting a, uh, a, a flat valve, on, on, in this case, on that. Um, and it's going to be put on the inlet right at Grand Cocos and Poplar. We're going to remove that inlet and put in a brand new structure with a valve on it. So we only have to water flow one direction. Um, as it turns out, I actually just got a call from John Fenimore a couple of days ago. A, a sinkhole formed right in front of that same inlet. Um, so it, the inlet itself is failing anyway. So we're kind of going to be killing two birds with one stone in this case. Um, so that we're, we're anticipating that will also come in under the bid threshold. Um, and I, which we can talk further on those, on those items, but we, we can get proposals rather than going out to bid. And if the, the committee uh, wants and, and our friend approves it, we can just do it by bids and have, and that, have that fixed. Um, once we have that installed, the flat valve or the, for the inlet protection, um, we also, the entire trunk line for that drainage system uh, there's several areas where we believe there's roots there. It's, it's clogged up with different debris and whatnot. Um, we are getting, uh, or actually we received already, um, proposals to video the pipe and clean the pipe. Um, and, and that would include cleaning any debris that's, that's movable. Rocks, stones, bricks, things like that. If there's roots that are impenetrable, impen um, they would stop at that point, go up to the next inlet and work back. So we can get the whole pipe TV and we'll know exactly where there are problems. Right. Once we have that done, then we, and if, there, if there are any roots blocking at all, we can then go out for another contract to cut that those specific areas. Hmm. So at this point, we're just guessing yeah. what's there. Um, so all that being said, once we get the, the valve on and it's pipe cleaned out, I'm pretty confident we're, we're, we're gonna pretty much solve the issues in Hickory Street flooding. Okay. Um, obviously in major storms where everything's flooded, you know, you know, but, but it will solve 99% of storms. Okay. Um, hey, Carrie, mm -hmm. yes. this is Fern. Uh, okay. Over in Mount Laurel on 38, and I don't know if it's a, a study they're doing with the, uh, the sewer drains on the highway, but it looks like there's a mesh put underneath the grate to, I guess, uh, keep the debris from going down into the storm drains. Mm -hmm. Do you know anything about that? Uh, I don't know about that specific, specific spot, but um, it, it, if it's during construction, then it's a temporary measure. We, we do that whenever we do construction. We put a fabric under the grate so it stops any runoff uh, debris from going down the inlet. There are also permanent structures that you can install that does basically the same thing. Um, but generally they're not for, for roadways because it, it takes too much maintenance um, and the amount of water that you have, it, 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 they don't really work. A lot of times we'll put them in parking lots and, and things like that. Um, so I'm not sure, I'm, I'm assuming it's probably a temporary measure that they're putting in the system. I was just wondering about keeping debris out of the pipes. So, you yeah. know. Unfortunately, it, it blocks up too much, and it, John would be out there every storm cleaning them out. You know, um, it, it's, it's really not feasible. Uh, the, the, new, the new storm grates, which are mandated to be installed throughout the town, which we are doing every time we do a project, um, have smaller holes in them. You might notice the, the grates themselves have smaller holes, and the, and the casting on the back of it. Um, back in the day, you remember the big hole that you could almost fit through. You know, try to fit through. Now there, there's it blocked off to, to no more than a four inch hole, um, so it stopped mostly for water bottles, for plastic bottles. That's really why they came up with it. Um, so it stopped a lot of debris, the large debris from going down the inlet by installing those those things. Now on Hickory Street, there's only a few that are have those type of casting uh, on the inlet. Uh, most of them are the old time where anything washing down the street can just wash into the inlet. Okay. Um, but again, it's not it's not cheap to do all that. So basically how we do it and, and how it's in our stormwater management plan is anytime we do a project that involves that inlet, we replace it with a new type of, of head and grade for poison purposes. 
yeah, you can you can actually see some in town that we've replaced, and you can see there's more debris in that area after a storm on top rather than it all flowing down into the into the sewer drain. It it doesn't do it anymore. And I, I noticed DR Horton has the mesh out there for their construction so that it doesn't go in that drain. I noticed that one. Um, there's two out there where they have that to stop any of their debris, I guess, from building. Yeah, that, that's they mostly do work. Yeah, exactly. Thank you, Harry. You're welcome. Um, we also have the, uh, the, the county park grant, um, the West Avenue work uh, that, that sewer construction performed. Uh, as it turns out, we actually have uh, approximately $16,000 left of county money that we don't want to leave on the table. Um, so uh, Richard and, and, and um, I guess Richard uh, led that and went to Rec and myself to see if there's anything we can do to use up that yes. money. Uh, Rec and I don't know if Phil is online or are you, are you there? Phil is okay. available. Um, he is online. Yes, okay. I have. Okay. Um, yeah, I, I, I reviewed with um, with Phil. They, they came up with what they would like to do. The Rec um, committee would like to install parking over a, a memorial over by the little t-ball field. Um, that was in the original plan that was taken out because at the time we didn't have enough money. Um, so we can add that back in to put in uh, stone parking over there. Um, there'll be some, some type of fencing to block vehicles from driving onto the field. Um, that was a request from, from John Fenimore. Uh, and I think we'll have a little bit of money left over that we may be able to do something else small with that money. Um, I believe we can just continue to contract with Sewer um, to finish this work. So we don't have to go out and get bid. We can just essentially reopen his contract right. and have him do the work. Yeah, it's basically if, if we don't spend it, we're not getting reimbursed for it. So, and we can't relocate it to any other project in town that we want to do. It has to be used at two locations. And we figured West Avenue would be the best situation for it right now. Okay. Good. Good. I'm glad you got you rec got the way in that and that John John Fenimore got a piece of that too. Okay. Um, and last I um the uh Zubro seawall. Um I do have a meeting with DEP, uh an engineer from DEP. Uh it's essentially going to be a strictly an engineering discussion uh between uh, he and I. Uh, out there on the schedule to go out on Wednesday and try and get our, our, our minds together on what we can what we can do there. Um, I, I think that's the best approach trying to do it from an engineering standpoint and it's political at this point and then we can move on from, from that. Um, so after Wednesday I, I hope to have some, some good news for you on, on Google. So we'll, we'll see what we can do. Wish you uh, well. That's all I have. Wish you well. Good luck on that one. Uh, quick question. I, uh, on a side meeting regarding uh, uh, the the property at 414 Rand Cocos. And uh, anyway, long story short, when Thor redid the backstop at Babe Ruth, there apparently was some kind of plaque or something like that uh, on the backstop on the on the caging. And do you know where that that went? Uh, or uh, rec or historic knows where that could, we got talking about it or somehow that came up in the discussion uh, on the plan for 414 Rand Cocos next to Gateway Park and we're kind of scratching our heads because the new back stops up and there's no plaque there. I only heard about it. Uh, history doesn't have it in storage. It's Peter driving yeah. in. All right. Yeah. Maybe uh, as far as far as I, I know, Mike, as recreation standpoint, I don't remember one on the back of the backstop at all. Uh -huh. I know there is the plaque on the sign next to the two trees True. that face out Coopertown Road. Yeah. Uh, that, as far as if there was a plaque, I, I uh, unfortunately, I think John Fenwick would be the best one to answer that if he's on. Right. Yeah, I, I have good photos of it. 
It's Peter. I, I have good photos of the original sign, so at least I know what it looks like, but I don't know where it went. Okay, all right. We'll, we'll find out what the, what the answer is, talking with John. Anything else, Harry? That's all I have, man. All right, thanks so much. Thanks for the good work all over town. Uh, Mr. Heinold. Good evening, everyone. Um, I think my work is all through today's agenda and uh, a couple items in the executive session, so unless anybody has any questions for me, um, I'll wait until we reach my items. All right, very good. Uh, Township Administrator, uh, Mr. Schwab. Thank you. Uh, let me follow up on uh, the most recent discussion you just had about the West Avenue parking. Uh, my role was to find out from the county that uh, we need to spend it on West or Bay Ruth. Rec then determined their high priority was the parking. Harry had this idea of uh, instead of closing out Thor's contract, we keep it going by uh, uh, sending back the maintenance bond and having the contract continue. I uh, ran it by Doug. Doug's opinion was that if by resolution, if we did that, we could, you know, do the change order and make the change. So if no one has any objections, we'll work with uh, Doug and Harry and make that happen in uh, your October 8th, 19th meeting. If we need to do a formal resolution, we'll do that. Any objections? No objection here. Uh, good, thank you. Um, the other thing is that I emailed you about the uh, county grant, current county grant for the uh, event lawn at Field of Dreams, and that uh, uh, Scott Taylor had recommended we do one piece of that right now while the uh, growing season is still there. Believe it or not, you want weeds to be in a growing season in order to kill them. You don't want to wait till they're dormant because then the weed killer won't kill them. So I'm asking for authorization to uh, spend up 3000 against that grant uh, for a contractor to spread the weed uh, killer product uh, that uh, Scott Taylor recommends. He's going to get multiple quotes, but we assume it's going to be $2,500 to $3,000 to get that done. The next step will be that, you know, Rec and the uh, liaison for the Township Committee and, and John and so on will be meeting together probably on site to come up with final plans uh, that uh, then uh, for what would be done in the spring. Scott would give us his proposal. He'd approve his proposal so he could write the specs and whether he does it or works with Harry or however they work on it. And we get out to bids during the winter for uh, the work to be done in the spring. Scott indicates that when you have dead weeds, you actually till them into the soil, they add to the uh, soil. And then we add the, the mixtures that they've been using to uh, uh, get things to grow out there and create this event lawn. We do have issues that we'll be discussing and bring to you about the irrigation system. Uh, we've had some problems with whether it's sufficient for what we have. And if we, we even talked about this event lawn, whether or not it needs irrigation and what would be the most cost effective way to do that. Harry has some ideas, but none of it, nothing's really cheap in terms of irrigation costs. But uh, let's at least get phase, mini phase one done. And then we'll bring to you uh, through rec uh, the proposals to uh, make the event lawn happen. So I'd like authorization by brief motion to uh, spend up to $3,000 on the weed uh, removal at Field of Dreams at the event lawn area. Make a motion for the, uh, for the uh, herbicide uh, weed eradication at the proposed uh, uh, lawn site. So moved. Second. Affirm. All in favor. All in favor. Aye. 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 Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, so we've got those two things moving along. Um, the other thing that uh, I Harry mentioned about uh, for under the 17.5 bid limit, hopefully we can do whether it's the uh, the flap valve work. Uh, at Rancocas Poplar or even the Robbins Lane area. If he has those proposals and we need to move faster than bring it to you first on the 19th, uh, I would assume that uh, you're supportive of uh, getting those projects moving along. My guess is that uh, by the time he has the numbers, the 19th is only two weeks from now, we can authorize those on the 19th to get the contractor started. 
But uh, does anyone have a problem if we can get uh, pricing under the 17.5 for either of those projects to get moving on them and then I can forward that on to you for approval on the 19th? Does anyone see a problem with that? No. No. Okay, good. At least we're working in that direction. The other thing to mention is uh, best practices. My and your favorite uh, state project. Uh, it's come out again as usual. Um, it's a very interesting uh, document. I'm gonna ask Janice to put on the agenda for the 19th to go over. There's really only uh, uh, 20 real questions and uh, you have to get you know, 50%, gotta get 16, I'm sorry, 16 out of the uh, 29, I apologize. 16 out of the 29 scored questions right to not affect state aid. Uh, we are well above that. Then they have a long list of unscored questions where in effect it's a survey. So I'll send something out prior to the meeting of the 19th. We'll spend a little bit of time on it. Under the rules, uh, the CFO, Bob Hudnell, myself send it in. The clerk then certifies that it's been discussed or is on the, an agenda for a meeting. In our case, hopefully we'll have discussed it and it's due by November 3rd. So it'll be an interesting exercise, but I don't see this as any kind of a major issue. So I'll be sending stuff out and you can look for it if anyone's got questions. Uh, you'll let me know between now and the 19th. Uh, the last thing on my list is the vacant lot, lot between set behind the 7-Eleven that we own. We're, we've got two potential bidders. As I said before, I was working with them before we sent it out formally. And there's a lot of little details, like we just got a question today about uh, the survey, who's gonna provide the survey to make sure the lines are correct. There's two people might be asking to subdivide it as opposed to one buying it. And then the question is, does one buy it and then go and get subdivided and then they pay each other or do we pre-subdivide it and how we handle that? So if they're interested in that stuff, Doug and I'll discuss it and we'll be coming back to you probably with a, a plan as to how to make that thing work. Small, small item, but it's amazing how complicated it gets when you get small, a lot of people involved. Uh, so I believe that's all I have for right now. Thank you. And I sent out the uh, budget memo in case anyone didn't see it. All right, thank you. Uh, let's see, department heads. Uh... Chief DeSanto. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, I got three uh, items. Um, the first one is Hawk Island update. I met with Thor Construction. They provided us with a quote to improve the uh, gate uh, that's currently at the dead end of Vine Street. Uh, their recommendation due to the, uh, I guess the number of tree roots, like Mr. Fenimore had indicated uh, to properly we do it is to uh, come forward approximately five feet, put a new gate system in, and then extend the end of the gate into the berm. So it's um, very noticeably that's a secure area and, um, and also use a deterrent. And that brings me to the other part of Hawk Island. Um, at last meeting, I-, I By the way, the cost, cost is $3,000, right, Jeff? Uh, yes, I'm sorry, yes. 3,000. If you want to move forward after he discusses this, you'll need to authorize up to 3,000 from open space funds. And uh, I will uh, check with Paul in reference to making sure that there's no issue with zoning and so forth, because it's not going to be in the same footprint as the current gate. The, um, the other issue is I, I advised you that I was going to reach out to the known owner according to tax records of a lot of interest on um, of interest for the police department on uh, Hawk Island uh, the peninsula known as Hawk Island and uh, in order to try to get some cooperation and communication going uh, to assist us by posting no trespassing signs and possibly enforcing uh, no trespassing well I was able to uh, gather some information and actually make contact of the of the last known owner. And um, he was not immediately interested in talking about authorizing the uh, signage going up and the enforcement of it. He was more interested in finding out if he truly owned the property. And then the uh, talks turned into possibly uh, turning the property over to the township. So that information was forwarded to uh, Mr. Einhold to uh, 
to, you know, to speak to the individual and where that goes, I don't know. But uh, I put a hold on it. Um, uh, I wasn't going to push the other end about him putting up signs and so forth until uh, this uh, this potential resolution is exhausted. I just wanted to keep you an update on that. And like I said, I'm going to take a step back until to see where this possibly could go. Um, the other uh, item is River's Edge. Uh, the no parking uh, solid yellow lines that we placed there. I don't even remember when. Time flies. It might have been 2017, but they're starting to fade. So I would ask Harry to prepare a quote for the uh, spring of 21 um, so we can um, get that done. Uh, there's no lines need to be refreshed and, and, and uh, they're starting to get worn. And there's no sense of doing it in the fall with the weather getting colder and colder. And Mr. Fenimore going through with plows. And so, um, so I think it's something that we should get a cost for in the spring and then and look to do it in the, in the spring of 21. Also, just give you an update in regards to River's Edge. I've been told November, I believe 18th is the, uh, is the right now planned end date for all construction. The reference to the uh, improvements that were obtained through that lawsuit that the Homeowners Association had with the builder. And so there is temporary parking on Burlington Avenue. And the plan is uh, once that construction ends, those temporary parking uh, areas will end on Burlington Avenue in the area of Falcon and Eagle as well. And in case you get any inquiries about it, because I had some inquiries about it by the residents of Rivers End. Um, Halloween, uh, just I know we're going to talk about that a little bit later, but just, just to remind you, uh, trick or treating by ordinance ends at 8 p.m. Uh, curfew is at 9 p.m. on uh, trick or treat night. And then on mischief night, well, the 30th of October, which is known as mischief night, uh, the uh, curfew is set for 9 p.m. by ordinance. Uh, Mr. Schwab and, and uh, I believe Ms. Lohr was notified by the county about the pedestrian crossing being installed this week on Franklin Street. A little vague about the timing. Uh, I'm trying to work with them to provide what they need. Uh, they're giving me a little bit of a, you know, Thursday, you know, Thursday or Friday. Uh, no times, uh, not a specific date. So we'll do our best to try to help them out. I'll try to continue communication and see if I can nail them down to a specific time on a specific date even. Um, in regards to uh, the ordinance that just passed public hearing 2020-13, I will work with Mr. Shedeker from Public Works to get the appropriate signage up at the Union Avenue uh, boat ramp uh, to show that the you know, motorboats are prohibited from docking. Uh, that's that's all I have. Jesse? Uh, yes. When the when the county comes in for this crosswalk, I, I it, the crosswalk at uh, Cooper Street and Hickory Street is barely there. Um, you can't see it at all. Will they? Can you get them to repaint that? Uh, I made the request before the COVID, but I will follow up on that because I'm going to have to communicate with them, try to nail down a, a date and a time for this uh, pedestrian crossing on Franklin Street. So when I talk to Marty, I'll, I'll remind him that I made that request. Okay, it's very faded. I, I walked it myself and couldn't believe that it was hardly there. Thank you. No, no problem. Chief, can I ask a question? Yes, go ahead. Um, tonight when I was walking on Delaware Avenue, um, it was like 10 to five. Um, I was met with a swarm of bike kids and you know, that's part of the course, but popping wheelies, turned back around and popped a wheelie, not even a foot from my dog. And much to my surprise, right behind me was a police officer in a truck that didn't stop, didn't intervene. I'm curious, I guess, how has the zero tolerance policy gone? Well, there's the second type of issue. And I'll address the issue that you had tonight. If you're saying the officer witnessed what occurred, Correct. I'll talk to them and remind them that what the zero policy policy is. Yeah, I mean we were just before the turn at Lilac, so 
like there was no way he didn't see it happen right in front of him. And it was a little chaotic with a, there was a motorcycle coming kind of, you know, in, in on my side of the road and all the kids all at once willied and then circled back. It was just, I was surprised given that that posting went up maybe two weeks ago from the police department saying that if they witnessed it, citations would be issued. Okay. Officer coming up behind you or coming the other direction? He was coming up behind me. Okay. And you were were coming towards him. I'm sorry. You were on Delaware Avenue at the time? Yeah, 10 to 5 at Lilac. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, Chief, that's that's not uncommon at all. I mean, it's uh, we've talked about this uh, several times uh, in our discussions over the last couple of weeks through the summer. And, uh, you know, you know, when are, when's anything going to be done? I mean, I just wonder, uh, we've got these packs of young people with their bikes, the loud music, uh, all hours, um, obnoxious, uh, swearing uh, as part of normal conversation. Um, uh, last week, um, two weeks ago, I think it was, um, there was a group down at the end of Union that uh, loud music, nine o'clock at night. Um, two of your officers uh, were answering a call uh, on Second or Third Street. I could see the vehicles down there, so they were they were uh, uh, on a call somewhere else. And I went down to talk to the uh, the young people at the end of Union, and was uh, excuse me told to fuck off. Um, and I hear this, you know, you're really tired of it. And it's, it's really kind of ugly what our young people are doing out there. And it's not, it's not a nice town anymore. And I'm just wondering, I mean, I'm not expecting you to be, you know, the police aren't to be the dad or the mom, but we're, lo- we're kind of losing it in our community here that this is the behavior that's okay. And, uh, you know, I've been listening to that all summer long. You know, the loud music, the horrible language. Uh, I had a family event at my house on Saturday afternoon, and that's what we heard all afternoon is that kind of crap. And if we're paying these this kind of tax dollars to live in this town, and this is what we're getting, and this is what we're spending thirteen, fourteen thousand dollars a year for the education of these kids, and that's the only word that they know. Something's really wrong here. And this town needs to get their, you know, um, are you, some, you know, what do you do? I'm looking for an answer from anybody. Um, some of the language that they say to women is even worse than the F word, believe me. Because um, yeah. I've heard it too. And um, my only comment to them is, you know, I'm somebody's mother. So is that how you talk to your mother? But Mike's right. It, it's this is not nice for Delanco. This isn't the town I grew up in, with the way these kids are behaving. And they are most most of them are from here, and they have parents. And I don't know what we can do as a town or our police force can help us do. I know Jesse. I asked Jesse to do something, and he posted that, which I appreciate, Jesse. I shared it on Facebook as well. And um, I thought maybe if the word would get out there, things would improve. But a couple of these kids need to, there has to be an example set. They need to be, we need to catch them. Uh Somebody needs to take a picture. They need to be charged. Uh, And that's what we need to do to set an example and say, guess what? This is not acceptable in Delanco. You know, even just the the issue I ran into with the kids playing loud music at nine at night. Yes, it's, it's. It doesn't fit in one part of the ordinance, but it's disruptive uh, to a residential neighborhood. And I tried to convey to the young people, uh, you know, you got people that uh, work uh, uh, different shifts. They're trying to sleep or, you know, going to bed early. Uh, uh, There's a young couple down the street. They've got a newborn, a one-year-old and a four-year-old and the music is disruptive. I mean, two blocks away and Nothing, no, no uh, empathy or consideration. It's all about them. It's all about 
I can do whatever I want, whenever I want, to whomever I want. And unfortunately, nationally, um, from the Oval Office on down, that's what we got. Um, and um, we've lost our soul. So anyway, whatever, um, you know, like I said, uh, as a community, uh, we need to, um, we need to do something. This is not a nice place to live um, in some respects anymore. So um, unfortunately. I, I, I don't wanna um, bash the police department because I walked the riverfront and I actually saw an officer Unfortunately, I, I don't, don't know who he is. I don't know a lot of the new young guys, but uh, there, there were a band of uh, children on the bikes and he actually stopped and talked to the kids and the kids talked to him. There was interaction that I like to see um, and it, it was nice. They just went about their way. And then the same officer, um, he had stopped a, a, fa a family was on somebody's private lawn um, and I, forget where it was somewhere around Oakford or something but uh he stopped and talked to the family and uh they were very receptive and said oh we didn't know and they got in their baby carriage and they they walked away so it's not all that bad I've been monitoring the kids this summer because I'm sure they've been cooped up and I've seen the bicycles and um you know I thought they were getting a little better this year I didn't really see the big uh, gangs down at the uh, camp meeting grounds of which when I did I, in the afternoon I got a nice tea and I saw uh, somebody had called the police on the kids because they were gathered and the officers came um, and uh, they they worked with the kids pretty well to move them along uh, um, I, I will tell you when the kids are on their bicycles I just ran into it um, Saturday I took a long motorcycle ride to uh, Ocean Grove New Jersey and I was riding through that town where my grandmother used to live and, and I had approached a gang of uh, teenagers on bicycles and uh, they, they were from the neighboring town, Asbury Park. And I said, uh oh, here we go. And, you know, they got right up on me and one challenged me and he uh, he yelled right in my ear, right next to my bike. And I just uh, I ignored him and laughed it off. And the other kids were laughing and I rode by. I'm like, you know, anytime you want to race on that thing, we'll go. But um, I, I have noticed the kids, I, I don't see the challenging, uh, you know, where they're riding into the traffic. I haven't seen the Facebook complaints about the kids uh, popping the wheelies. Um, you know, it's unfortunately that they get so loud. I did see a couple of kids smoking pot down on uh, Delaware Avenue and they just didn't seem to care. Like, you know, they just thought it was okay. But that's everywhere. You walk in the streets of Philadelphia and there you smell it. It's right next to you. Um, I think we got to hang in there, Mike. I still think it's a good town. It's a quaint town. Um, and, you know, we have to hang in there with these kids. Uh, pretty soon it'll be too cold for them to be out. Yeah. And the boaters won't be out. And, you know, we, we suffer the same problems, you know, year in and year out. But, uh, you know, I, True. you know, we're, we're going to, we can't let them beat us. Yeah. Well, parents need to be parents and our young people need to be mature young, young people. Yeah, respectful, I think, is the word. <laughs> yes. No, I don't know, though, if they're using foul language. I don't know if that's against the law. Is that, is that, I know it's not right, and I would never let my kids do that, but um, I don't think you can charge them with anything, can you? Is that, Chief, is that a... Well, if there's other people around who are offended by it, yes, you can. It's a thin line, but even with juvenile, charging a juvenile, you're not going to get an immediate satisfaction. Uh, you know, I'll be honest with you, the charge is not going to go anywhere. Uh, yeah. Kind of depending on the parents being getting noticed and involved. Uh, if they find that behavior not an issue, then then we're kind of like in a, in a circle. Uh, but don't the police really know who the uh, habitual uh, kids are? I know when I was a kid, uh, you know, the cops knew us. They knew all me and my friends and they knew where to find us. And they, you know, if there was problem, they came to the house and banged on the door, you know, and is that the way with our force? Don't they know who these kids are? In general, but you know, I'm sure you, you have an idea that the, um, you know, I guess the respect for authority is nowhere near what it was when you were a young person. And it's not what I, when I was a young person, there is, um, you know, if a police officer came to my house, 
I wasn't worried about the police officer. I was worried about my parents. Yeah. <laughs> you got that right. <laughs> but I think as, as, as Mr. Brown pointed out, Chief, I, I think more one-on-one or one-on-15 interaction by the, our officers with our young people. Uh, if nothing else, just to get let them know that they're being that someone's watching them, and, and you know, not not spying on them, but you know, if they start getting out of line and becoming a, a general nuisance, something's going to be, you know, a, an officer is going to um, set an example and make a correction. And uh, I, I really think that. Um, I think that would go a long way. And like I said, as, as we've discussed over the last couple of weeks, you and I, uh, I think at this time nationwide, I think our people need to see our officers and get to know them uh, as you know, Sergeant Hoffman and Lieutenant Tilger and uh, Sergeant Maloney and get to know our people and our, pe our officers get to know our community. Um, and I think that goes both ways. I agree, Mike, and from Mr. Brown's example, I mean, you know, the message has been conveyed and obviously it wasn't heard by everyone, but it will be heard. So yeah. I'll continue to work on that. All right, thank you. Mayor, Mayor, um, before you move on from this topic, we have um, two um, comments from the public that uh, were entered through chat. This is new territory. It's not an open to the public, but we, do have uh, two residents who have typed in uh, some comments on this matter. So uh, if you'd like, I can I can read those comments sure. at this time. Yeah. Cool. One resident uh, participating in the meeting um, has uh, typed in, kids have nothing to do in this town. Have we thought about investing in them? The second comment is, I ran into a group near Pennsylvania, on Pennsylvania, near the station on Saturday, about seven kids popping wheelies and blocking the street. And so those two comments were um, entered in through our the chat function, Zoom chat function. Very good. appreciate those comments. And uh, I guess that's uh, a, a pathway for communication that we're gonna have to we'll be well exercised. Uh, anybody have any, any response or comment on those two? Uh, just, just for technical purposes, do, do, uh, do the members see the chats all entered in? Yeah. Yes. Okay. I saw them. I saw okay. them as they typed them in. Okay. Bring the uh, bring that window up. Okay. I'll, I'll comment on you know the comment that the kids have nothing to do. I've I've heard this uh, for twenty years, and um, no matter what you give the kids, uh, they're going to get bored with it. You give them the basketball court, that they play that out. You give them the skate park, they play that out. You give them organized sports. They play that out. Uh, we've chased them from the 7-Eleven to the basketball courts, from the basketball courts to the 7-Eleven. You know, they go back and forth, back and forth. Uh, you know, I don't know. I'll never forget. I said that when I first got on the Township Committee in the year 2000, and uh, my co-committeeman at the time, Brett Harris, I said to him, I said, well, you know, we got to give these kids more things to do. And I never forget what he told me. He said, we're not their babysitters. And I thought it was a little, a little uh, crude what he said. Like, wow, I, he set me straight, like right off the bat. I think it was, <laughs> you know, he said, we're not their baby. I was like, what? Uh, but I thought about that year after year after year. And uh, he's partially right. You know, I mean, parents have to take more of a role in doing things. But I know when the teenagers, I had teenagers, and then they get on and they, they leave the house and you don't want them to, and they're on those bikes. And I'll never forget one day I saw my kids and a bunch of local kids. They're floating down the river on somebody's dock that they broke loose. And there they are out having a Tom Sawyer adventure. And I was like, oh, my God, look at this. And what do you, what do, you do? What do you do? You can't control your kids sometimes. So they come home and you talk to them and you, you tell them how dangerous it is to be out in that river and so forth and so on. I'll tell you to the parents and, and the, it, it passes and then your kids leave and they're gone. And uh, sometimes when I see these kids around town with all that energy, I kind of, I kind of miss it uh, watching, you know, I, I watch them, you know, and I do Listen, I live right on Burlington Avenue with kids walk down the street and they're using foul language. And, you know, I can't believe they're yelling and, and the way they talk to young girls, girls that they like, you know, they're, they're like screaming across the street, like, 
go F and B. And I'm like, that's no way to get a girlfriend, buddy. You know, and you're afraid to say something to him because, you know, kids, uh, you know, they want to fight you. They're not afraid. They're, they're juveniles. Like Jesse said, they're not going to court. Or if they do, it'll be dismissed or whatever. But, um, you know, what, what else can we do for them during the day? They're already not in school, uh, which I personally think they need to get back in school. And then after school programs have to take place, such as the basketball and baseball and so forth and so on, uh, the, the high school football games, give them something to do. But pretty soon those kids are going to be in cars and uh, they're going to be cruising around and they're going to be, um, you know, looking for girls and so forth and so on. And we got to hang in there. I mean, they, they have the All right. donuts to get snacks, 7-Eleven to get snacks, Liberty, uh, All right. All right. Get, you know. All right. I'm hey. done. Thanks, John. Uh, anything else, Chief? I, I no, I, I don't have anything else. So just, well, I guess the one thing, uh, you know, to the one comment, if, if you see them um, and you don't see one of our officers around, please don't hesitate to call 461-1515. Thank you. Well, Chief, I have a question. Uh, it's regarding one of the resolutions tonight. Um, it's the um, Governor's Council on Alcoholism and Drug Abuse. It's a, it's a joint, um, it's actually a shared service we do with Riverside. And I believe that our portion was for our DARE program, which has another name now, but since that's not happening this year, are we able to utilize some of those funds for something else? What? The, the answer I think is no, but I wouldn't count that it's not happening this year because if they do go back to school, typically we do this in the, in the uh, spring of the school. Okay. Year. Good. Uh, okay. All right. All right. Thank you. You're welcome. All right. Uh, let's see. Administration, Mrs. Lohr. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> that was it. <laughs> that wasn't Mrs. Lore. That was not Mrs. Lore. <laughs> that was Eric's son, I think. Little <laughs> sound like a little kid. Okay. We have on October, Saturday, October 17th, we have uh, two events for residents. Uh, we have a free shredding event from 8 a.m. to 1 p.m. at the Delanco Township Municipal Building parking lot. Um, and this is a, a non-contact event. And that um, the occupants of the vehicles must wear a face mask and they have to have their, the bags and boxes accessible for the staff to retrieve without uh, coming in contact with the um, occupants of the, of the vehicle. So that's a free shred shredding event, Saturday, October 17th at the Delanco Municipal Building parking lot, 8 a.m. to 1 p.m. Same day, we have a community cleanup day, another community cleanup day. And that's uh, through the public works garage right next door. And again, this is a non-contact event. Occupants of the vehicles must wear um, masks and um, the public works employees will unload items from the vehicles that are accessible, but they will not enter into the vehicle. So um, the flyers are for both these events are available on the website. We have on uh, Saturday, November 7th, we have the rabies clinic. Um, for uh, dogs and cats that uh, need their rabies shots renewed. And it will be this year, and that's also at the Public Works Garage. This year, year it will be 9 a.m. to 12 noon. We're adding an hour because we have to provide for social distancing between the people and the animals. So it's gonna take a little bit longer. We wanna spread out the time, uh, you know, have people have more time and, and less people backed up for just two hours. So we're adding an hour, we will social distance. We're going to use a numbering system so that um, if you have to remain in your car until your number is called, we will um, have that. Aaron, one note real quick. I noticed on the website that the initial post says it's from 10 to noon, but the flyer says 9 to noon. So can we get that corrected on the website? Yeah, I'll fix that. No problem. Thank you so much. Yep. Thank you. And that's the rabies clinic. We received... Um, and maybe Erin can talk about this a little bit more since she is here. Erin is heading our 2020 census counts and activities to make sure we get as many Delanco residents counted in this uh, the census for 2020. We received an email today that we have 
actually superseded and surpassed our 2010 um, percentage of responses. So we are on track. And the census has been um, um, ex expanded or uh, extended. So there's still time for our residents to get their census response in. And maybe we can uh, really get up there as close to 100% uh, response as possible. And this um, does affect grant allocations and different programs that would be available to Delanco um, through our census um, data that is collected. And Aaron, did, uh, since Aaron is in charge, is, um, is the lead on our 2020 census effort. Do you have anything else you'd like to add, Aaron? Uh, I just to mirror kind of what you said about we surpassed our 2010 self response rate. So what that means is that the residents of the town have taken it upon themselves to respond, which does not, so that doesn't include any of census takers coming around and assisting a resident to, um, to, to respond to the census, which is really good. It means that the town, you know, is coming together and doing their part for the census on their own without the help of somebody knocking on their door. Um, they I actually got a text from our Burlington County representative this weekend. And she did tell me that, Janice, you are correct. They extended the census date um, for responding. And I apologize, I wasn't prepared to tell the, ah, here we go. Um, they've now extended it to October 31st. So um, we still have time to get people to respond and you know by phone or by uh the website um is considered self-response so i'll be putting out some more information um in an email blast this week very good thank you thank you Aaron. And one uh, one last item for this section is that i just wanted to report on the status of the vote by mail ballots um for the number November 3rd general election. We've been receiving a lot of phone calls at the municipal building. Where's my ballot? Where's my ballot? Delanco residents, for the most part, I don't know of anybody in Delanco that has received their ballot. We should be receiving them in the next few days because today, October 5th, was the um, deadline by executive order that all counties, because the ballots come from the county election um, department not the municipality, but they had a deadline of October 5th to get those ballots in the mail. And I know Burlington County did mail them out in batches. They had well over 300,000 to get out and um, they've been uh, mailing them out all during this past week. And um, today was the deadline. So I, I hope anticipate that residents should be receiving their ballots um, very, very soon in the next few days. Um, the list of the drop boxes throughout the county um, is published on our website. Um, so if you do not want to put yours back in the US mail, it is a, a prepaid postage. You don't have to put postage on it. But if you feel if any resident or voter feels that they want to put it in a secure ballot, uh, take it to a location. Um, Delanco does not have one of the drop boxes. The two closest are the Cinnamons Municipal Building and the Willingboro Municipal Building. Um, and those locations are on. Um, on our website. And this is where, and, can I just yes. interject here? The drop box that's in front of the municipal building is not for ballots. No, and we're going to have a sign. All right. We're going to have a sign tomorrow telling people this is not a vote by mail drop box ballot, and we're going to have a larger sign um, out there where those are located. Um, so yes, I was thinking that as I was driving home uh, from work tonight that we need to get that sign up there. Uh, that the drop box in front of our municipal building is not a ballot, a vote by mail ballot drop box. Um, for those people that need to vote on a machine because of a disability, November 3rd, there, um, from 6 a.m. to 8 p.m., there will be one voting machine for disabled voters. Disabled voters will need to fill out a cert uh, certificate of disability. And um, then those voters, those disabled voters will be permitted to vote on the voting machine. Um, people who have uh, lost, misplaced their um, vote by mail ballot or don't feel comfortable with that can also go to the Pearson School on November uh, 3rd. 
uh, from 6 a.m. to 8 p.m., but they will give it, be given a paper provisional ballot, which must be qualified and, and reviewed by the county before it is counted as a, a legitimate, that's why it's called provisional. Uh, but that is available if someone has misplaced or lost their ballots or just wishes to vote on a paper provisional ballot. Also, um, those that feel more comfortable with returning their vote by their completed vote by mail ballot, um, to, they can take that to the Pearson School on election day, on election day only from 6 a.m. to 8 p.m. and um, sign in and show ID and give that to a board worker, the completed uh, vote by mail ballot. Um, will be accepted that day at the at the Pearson School on election day. And the last day to register to vote for this election is October 13th. Uh, we have a state has a election site, njelections.org. They tell us, I haven't seen it yet. They tell us you'll be able to track your ballot. So your vote by mail ballot, but that's njelections.org. And that's what I have for this section there. Thank you. Thank you. A lot of imp very important information. Uh, public Works, Mr. Fenimar, or anybody representing Public Works out there in the virtual world. All right. Consent agenda. Consent agenda items are considered to be routine, will be enacted in a single motion. Any item requiring discussion will be removed from the consent agenda. All consent agenda items will be reflected in full in the minutes. Are there any items on the consent that uh, any committee member would like to have considered separately or any questions answered? I would like to uh, question resolution 2020-121, the pilot agreement with GR Urban Renewal. I have three questions. Okay, you would like that off consent, Mr. Yeah, Brown? Well, can I get my questions answered first? I'm sure they're, I don't, um, Let's, let's pull let's pull that aside John and I think Doug can uh, might have some uh, I'm sure some information I th think I got a couple questions and we'll just set that aside we'll do go through the consent and then come back and, and talk about uh, 121 any other items that uh, the committee wants to uh, pull out or, or have questions on to consider separately All right. Uh, consent agenda, resolution 2020-116, resolution certifying liens against certain properties for costs incurred by the township in accordance with chapter 135 of the township code. Resolution 117, resolution to cancel property taxes for properties acquired by the township at Delanco. Resolution 118, resolution certifying receipt of audit. Resolution 119, uh, governor's council on alcoholism and drug abuse form 1A. Resolution 120, memorializing authorization to pay off a third party tax lien on 15 Hawk Island property now held by the township at block 2300 lot four. Uh, 121, we're pulling off consent. Payment of bills, account uh, general, uh, $10,325.55. Uh, and that was on September 17th. Uh, the October 5th amount uh, general was $729,601.92. Payroll for September 17th, uh, $41,109.86. On October 5th, $95,000 even, 74 cents. Escrow trust on September 17th, $27,398.25. Housing trust on October 5th, uh, $149.75. Municipal open space on September 17th, $139.61. And on October 5th, $856.76. Uh, mm -hmm. The approval facility used for Riverbank Zerber Park does not apply. That uh, is being deleted, that request. Uh, approval department reports as submitted. The approval consent agenda, please. A motion. No move. Second. Who got that first? JB. John Brown. Second was. First, Jane. Chris, Chris Holland. Roll call, please. Mr. Brown. Yes. Ms. Fitzpatrick. Yes. Ms. Holland. Yes. Mr. Olet. Yes. And Mr. Templeton. Yes, thank you. Uh, resolution one. Uh, Resolution 2020-121, authorizing execution of pilot agreement with GR Open Renewal 
LLC phase 2A Stanker and Galetto project. Uh, which do you want to go first? Uh, Mr. Heinhold, do you want to talk about some things or do you want to just answer questions? Just real quickly for the benefit of the public, this is um, what's being referred to as phase 2A of the redevelopment project that is being undertaken by Stanker and Galetto. The first phase was RLS. This, this second phase is for misfits. Uh, this particular phase is actually going to be owned by uh, Stanker and Galetto still and rented out to misfits. And um, uh, so that's the overview. The, the square footage is somewhere just shy of 160,000 square feet. So any, what, what, what questions do we have? John? Okay, uh, first of all, the new name, GR Urban Renewal, okay? So that sets him aside from the, uh, the, the other one. I'm a little bit confused and without getting, you know, super lawyer, uh, you know, does this protect him from, from one versus the other? If so, why? Yeah, so uh, because that's what the law requires under the, under the uh, redevelopment law. Basically, every entity that's created that is an urban renewal entity actually has to say urban renewal in its name. And so the history of this project is that somebody, let, let's say from the beginning, Stanker and Galetto had RLS who wanted to build 400 plus thousand square feet and, and could use all of that space. The, we would have gotten one, one urban renewal entity and one pilot, we would have been done with it. But uh, the first phase was, uh, I don't even remember now, under, under 100,000 square feet. This second phase is 160 roughly, and we're expecting a, a 2B phase to be coming. Each of those phases it's, is its own distinct uh, entity. And because they're coming online at different times, the pilots do not run concurrently. I'm not sure that's exactly the right way to put it. But well, I understand. Yeah, they, they don't all have the same start date. So you need separate legal entities for each of those phases. Okay, uh, the, the pilot numbers. Uh, I'm sure Joe Raymond was involved in this. Is this, are they the same as RLS? So they're actually better. If you recall, when we went into that process, what we did is we negotiated something called minimum rents to make sure that we were getting at least what we wanted to obtain out of the redevelopment process in terms of economic benefit to the township. And we categorized three potential use groups. Uh, the first base use group is warehousing. The second group is uh, what Misfits does, which is sort of a, a processing type facility. And the highest use is, is cold storage, which is what RLS does. Uh, we also had a provision that says if the actual rent exceeds the minimum rent, then the actual rent will, will apply. And in this case, even though they fall in the mid-tier group, their actual rent actually matches pretty closely to what the top tier uh, cold storage rental rate is. So we're doing better than the minimum rent that we negotiated. So the number we're generating out of this is, is in my opinion, a positive for the town. Is, is, this, is this cold storage? No. What no, I, I didn't. I, Mike, I know, attended a, an event there. I've read about this entity just online, but I don't know if anybody wants to shed any light about exactly what they, what they do there. Uh, Kate and I were out there last Friday for the, uh, for the ribbon cutting. Um, what, Misfits uh, is a four-year-old company, uh, started in a, a person's garage in, in Philadelphia, and this is their fourth location. They've been kind of expanding and growing by leaps and bounds. And I believe they're gonna have another facility being built, I think in Salt Lake City. Uh, but what they do is, um, uh, things that I learned is they have a, a network of uh, approximately 160 farms. And 
uh, food producers, agricultural producers, farms, so forth, that they buy direct from. And what they purchase is uh, fruit produce, um, food product, um, agricultural um, apples, pears, you know, lettuce, that is not of, a, 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 it's a lower Wegmans or ShopRite or Whole Foods will buy a, a, the perfect apple and the perfect head of lettuce. And what Misfits buys is the apple that's got a funny shape. They buy the Mr. Potato Head of the fruits and vegetables. And what they do is they buy that because the farmers that grow this stuff can't sell that to Whole Foods and ShopRite and Wegmans because they won't buy it. And so literally millions of pounds of uh, produce gets plowed under and destroyed every year because the uh, what we in the supermarket have gotten accustomed to buying, it doesn't fit that picture. Uh, Misfits uh, has filled that niche where they've, uh, they buy this, uh, this product. Um, they're a subscriber type uh, organization. You go online, uh, you become a member or you buy uh, they have different size boxes and you get what they get in season. And it may be the funny shaped pear. It may be the funny shaped uh, uh, or sub, you know, smaller size uh, head of lettuce that uh, Wegmans doesn't want to buy. And uh, it's a fresh produce. It's not something that was rolling around on the floor at the food distribution center down by the docks in Philadelphia. It comes direct from the farm to Misfits and they ship it out. Uh, FedEx, UPS, Amazon. So that kind of in a nutshell is what they do. And they've, uh, just to add a, a few comments, they've added some products as well. Um, they sell things other than produce uh, because I went on, I, I became a member and I went on and uh, customized my box today. So they have chocolate, they have popcorn, they have pasta. They have a lot of different things, uh, a lot of different products that aren't just fresh produce. And um, it's an incredible um, process what they do. And they, um, they actually employ over 700 employees. It's just amazing. Uh, certainly glad to have them in Blanco. Oh, no doubt. My final question, uh, are the, has the CO been issued? Are they operating? Uh, they're operating under a TCO is my understanding. They don't have a C, final CO yet. Okay, so this year one of the pilot, Richard, uh, this is funds that we can't use uh, in next year's budget? All pilots come in as unanticipated revenue and therefore go into surplus. Correct. So when we get the money, we won't get a full year's worth of this if we get the fourth quarter. Okay. Uh, then the fourth quarter comes in next year. You'll see, you know, the full hundred and forty-five thousand come okay. in, and then that then goes to surplus that's used for twenty twenty-two. Thank you. That's all I have, Mike. Thank you. Uh, my only question: uh, I've been going back and forth with Mr. Heinhold as I as I always do on these pilots. But anyway, uh, did the answer? Uh, between Stenker and Galetto and Misfits and us as far as a 10 year, 20 year and, and the options. So just to explain what the issue is, if you look at the, uh, towards the end of the document, there are exhibits that were submitted. And one of those exhibits references the fact that the lease between Stenker and Galetto and Misfit has a 10 year initial term and then two, five, uh, year terms for a, to a potential total of 20. So in my, in my review and from a legal standpoint, it's my opinion that the way the pilot's written and the way the law intends, we're entering into a pilot agreement with Stanker and Galetto. And the framework for that pilot is what they're presenting to us. If they lose their tenant, we still have a pilot with them. The same way if you, if somebody was outside of this process and built, uh, let's say Dolan built a building uh, and had a tenant for five years and lost it, 
their tax assessment wouldn't go away. Their taxes would remain the same. Uh, this pilot would remain an ongoing obligation to be paid. Um, that's my my view and my opinion as to how that would work. I re so Mike spoke to somebody at Sanker Galetto at the at the ribbon cutting, who thought uh, that if there was a change in tenancy, they could come back and get a, a second pilot again. And I don't agree with that analysis. So I've reached out to uh, uh, Rocco Tedesco, who's been their point attorney on on the redevelopment process. Um, but that was just this morning and Rocco has not gotten back to me yet uh, on that issue. So I don't have confirmation that he agrees that we're all on the same page on that uh, as we sit here tonight. So guys, thank you just two editorial changes. I don't know if you've got them. Christina, yes. I noticed that you had 10% and then 13, the word 10 should be 13 in both places. Yes, so I've marked up my copy, Kate. I'll make sure those uh, are corrected. That's on page six of 25. I've got that marked. And I'll also note that Mike in, in his comments noted another error on page nine, uh, which referred to section 177. And while the agreement is fairly lengthy, there's not 177 sections to it. So that's a typo. Thank you. Um, so Doug, do you feel we can we can consider this tonight or do you want to get an answer from Mr. Tedesco? Well, I went back and looked at the resolution and it does say subject to the final review and approval of the township attorney. Um, if you're, if the committee is comfortable with moving forward, we can make sure that we're square on that issue before we finalize it. Um, if we, if you want to wait until the next meeting, I don't think that's a huge issue either. Um, my, one of the other things I want to resolve with them is, is the start date on this. And my, my view is TCO, once they were able to occupy the building and started collecting rent from Misfit is the, is the start date. So I don't have, I don't have a strong opinion one way or the other. If, if you want to wait a couple of weeks, that's fine with me. If you want to move forward it and just trust that, that I'll wrap up those last couple of issues, that's fine with me. Too. Well, I always trust that you'll wrap up those issues. But I'd I'd like to get all the T's crossed and I dot it and nope. do, do it right. No we're not putting a band-aid on something later on. That's, so let's that's for this uh, resolution one twenty one for the uh, we'll pencil it in for the uh, August uh, excuse me October nineteenth meeting. Everyone yes. okay with that? Yes. All right. All right that completes. Do you have anything else to add on that, Doug, or? Uh, I don't at this time. October 19th, oh no, no. Next, next Monday is the holiday. I'm actually available that night, I think, if, if you need me to jump on briefly for that discussion. We'll put it at the top of the, uh, the agenda, and, and if anyone's got any further questions or you got something to elaborate on, then we'll get, get it done and let you go. Uh, sounds good. All right, thank you. Thank you. All right, meeting open to the public for comments and questions, session two. Comment question session of the meeting is now open. Please. Uh, Hello. Raise your hand, uh, call out, type in a ch chat. Uh, hi, can you hear me? Hello. Yes. Yes, hi. This is uh, Steve McLaughlin. I'm at uh, 740 Red Focus Avenue. Uh, here in uh, I just, Hey, uh, I have an idea kind of from left field um, related to the, the question of, of what to do about the bike kids. <laughs> um, so here's my, here's my thought. Uh, essentially, so why not uh, make some improvements over at the skate park and let kids use their bikes uh, at the skate park? Um, I can imagine that the insurance might be more expensive, but I've been to, I, I'm speaking as a skateboarder, <laughs> not a biker, but I, I've been to many skate parks where uh, municipal skate parks, at least this is the way it was in Texas where I lived for a few years. Um, a lot of skate parks are open to bikers and, and it, you know, it could be at least a, a release valve um, to attract some of those kids right. over there. So just an idea, something to potentially look into. Um, I, I'll, I'll just, I'll throw on one just to 
give a little bit of context, um, I would say that, that skate park is uh, in, in disrepair uh, to some degree. The surface, the asphalt is pretty rough and um, the, uh, the plastic or rubber surface of uh, uh, one of the ramps in particular is not in great shape. So at some point in the next, you know, at some point in the relatively near future, it, it will need some attention in some form. So yeah, public work and then and, and, uh, joint insurance fund safety the uh, consultant uh, uh, public works inspects it every week and uh, the, the our joint insurance fund safety consultant does include that in his inspections of township facilities skate parks mm -hmm. are um, one of the things that the joint insurance fund really does not want municipalities to have uh, mm -hmm. for, uh, obvious reasons of the liabilities uh, that they seem to attract, liabilities and inju injuries and claims and suits and everything. So our, mm -hmm. our skate park in Delanco is, I think, one of two or three in the county that are kind of grandfathered in mm -hmm. for the more stringent requirements uh, were enacted uh, through the GIF and, and the underwriting insurance company. So we mm -hmm. try to make, we have to maintain it as it is. We cannot expand it or change it mm -hmm. in any meaningful way um, because in the view of the insurer, that's a new item and the cost to meet that new higher standard uh, uh -huh. may be a big hill to climb. So, but. Uh, okay, well, not, not to push too much, but what about a, <laughs> like an improvement that would, like a change that would improve safety. I mean, like the current asphalt surface is, really rough. It's the kind of surface that if you fall on it, it will make you bleed. Um, a concrete surface would be a lot better. Um, I have no idea how much that would cost. There's a lot of question marks along that, but I'm just getting a sense of what's permissible, you know, what's possible. Would it be possible to resurface, for instance? Right. Well, I think that's something that uh, both Public Works and Recreation, uh, which we've got a couple members that are in the listening audience here tonight, uh, and they're, they're mm -hmm. We would only be able to, uh, Mike, this is Phil McFadden, uh, we would only be able to repair the surface. We cannot uh, like move bars or anything like that. And the current um, bicycles aren't permitted. And I'm assuming the, re the issue we have with it is when the bicycles go on the ramp, that causes the damage to the surface of the ramp. Mm. So, um, as far as extent, putting concrete down, it, as soon as we move one bolt on the base to move the ramp, we're mm -hmm. no longer grandfathered in. The whole thing would have to be removed because to be in all honesty, Delanco mm -hmm. could not afford the insurance that we would be whacked with, that we mm -hmm. would have to come up with just to redo a whole new park. I don't think we'd be able to get it insured again, mm -hmm. to be honest with you. I don't think okay. we have the big enough area for a bicycle park there either. Um, I think we would need a lot more space than what is allotted right now. I think the other problem is the uh, that you know the kids. It used to be the BMX bike that uh, kids would want to take on those those little ramps. Uh, these kids today mm -hmm. with these wheelie bikes, these are much bigger bikes uh, that I don't know if they're even going on there, are they? Does anybody know if they're taking those wheelie bikes up there? I mean, the I, wheelies I, have done on a hard surface. I see more of the Razor scooters going up and down them. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, well, it's, it's just a thought. I mean, yeah. it seems like skateboarding is a little bit out of fashion in this town and biking is in. So um, it sounds like maybe your hands are tied, but yeah. No, keep it in the back of the comments, Steve. Any anything else? To add? Yep. Uh, nope, that'll do All it. Right. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thanks for calling in. Any other public comment, please? And, and Mayor, this uh, also uh, with the new requirement, this would be the time for anyone uh, that uh, had any questions or comments that they could uh, enter that via their the chat function on Zoom. So uh, that is available also. Either. Um, the live video audio or the chat function. Mike, it's uh, Matt Bartlett again, 1800 second. And, uh, real quick, I just put my hat on as a DISA rep. Uh, we did start our fall soccer season uh, last month. It's been uh, very successful so 
far. Uh, we are down about 25% of our registrants over last year, but uh, it's good for the kids. They're out of the house. So we have all age brackets up to uh, U14 in soccer. Um, all of our teams are co-ed right now to coincide with what the other um, community organizations are doing, um, Cinnamons and Delran and so forth uh, within the league, uh, but uh, they're all going. Um, we're, unfortunately, we're probably not gonna be able to do Fall Fest, uh, Fall Feast again this year like we do all years. That's a big hit to our budget as one of our uh, big fundraisers for the year and uh, as well as our sponsors that go along with that. So uh, with budget season coming up, I just ask if you remember that, but um, you know, the kids are having a good time. It's great to see them out of the house. We get all precautions in place. Uh, we got uh, temperature checks being done when the kids enter the field by the coaches. Uh, we do have our concession stand in place and uh, we're not selling anything that's made there, just prepackaged items and six foot uh, separation. So everyone's uh, going good. Everything's good with the program. And uh, just wanted to report that uh, we do have something positive going on right now, even with the COVID in effect for these kids. Thank you, Matt. Thanks Matt. for the on that. I went to opening day, Matt, and it was really nice to see everybody out there. And I met Charlene, who was working in the concession stand. And uh, I thought it was incredible that this woman comes all the way back to Delanco to work for DICE. So. Yeah, she can. Yeah, she has no uh, kids in the program anymore. Yeah. More, all of her kids are out, uh, and uh, she drives up uh, six days of the week um, from, I think she lives down in Delmar. Delmar, yeah. Yeah, down in Camden County. Yeah, we're very lucky. Yeah, she, she gets up there about 5.30 every night, leaves about 8 o'clock, and then on the weekends, I know this Saturday, she was up there around 8 o'clock, and she probably didn't leave, I think, probably until about 3.30 in the afternoon, plus all the time she puts in with... Uh, uh, going to the stores and getting all the product to sell at Costco and BJ's and all that sort of thing. But yeah, well, she's uh, definitely a great benefit to us and we definitely. certainly do appreciate her. I'm glad to meet her. Yeah, we also uh, just want to give a shout out to uh, Diamond Tool over in uh, Edgewater Park. Uh, we got our lights for the field rented for them this year. They gave us a pretty nice uh, percentage off um, just as being in our neighboring community, literally a half mile down the road. So they helped us out tremendously with our uh, light standards, which are a huge budget hit to each to us each year. But uh, we went to them and you know, they heard our pleas and they were uh, a great uh, community member for us. Well, not in Delanco, only half mile down the road. Nice. Right. Thank you. Any nice. other comments? I see there was a, a chat comment from uh, Mr. Mossop. Uh, Maybe it's best to explore other options for the skate park if the insurance handcuffs really prevent any improvements or modifications there. So that's something we can think about if uh, the skate park is past its, its, uh, its shelf life. Uh, and I, I have a comment. Oh, wait, we have, just in line, we have another comment uh, from Mr. McLaughlin again, as long as we're grandfathered in. I'd love to keep the park as it is. It took a lot of work from me and my friends to get it put in. All right, good. Uh, Peter Fritz of 303 Union Avenue. Uh, two quick comments. So uh, one of them, um, uh, Janice, I sent you a photograph of the sign that was on the backstop. I don't know whether it's still there or not, but at least you have, you'll have a, a photograph of what the sign looked like so you know what you're looking for. To my township, uh, to my township. You, your yeah. township account. I just sent an email since I had the photo. Okay. Uh, uh, the other thing is uh, we're in political season now, and uh, I was surprised to learn this year that there is a, a limit on political signs, that you're limited to two signs per lot. And uh, it um, was concerning to me because I, I, I support uh, candidates at a number of levels, uh, federal level, um, state, district, local, uh, school board. Um, and I can understand why there, there should be a window for when they can go up and when they come down. And I think it's probably a good idea to put a limit to how many of the same signs that can go out. But it seems to be sort of artificial to say you're only allowed to support uh, and advocate for two candidates at two different levels 
when when there's so many things going on, especially in a, in a general electorate, uh, election year as we have this year. Um, and um, I, I wonder if you give some thought to that on a First Amendment basis. Interesting point. Anybody have any uh, comment on that? Well, where did you find this rule? Is it in our town ordinance? Yes, it's in- I believe so. I was told at, the, at uh, our last uh, meeting that the, the limit is two, two signs per lot. Mm -hmm. Mike, maybe you could uh, speak to that. I think that came up at the meeting, didn't it? Yeah, I believe that's, uh, that's what our code says. I can take a look at it and see if there's um, there's any constitutional issue there. All right. Okay. Awesome. Thank you. Peter, I just checked my email, my uh, township email. I, I was going to forward it, but I don't see it. Can you resend that? I sure can. And you want me to, I'll make sure that and I send it to your uh, your township. Yeah. Yes. Okay, thanks. Thank you. And there were two additional comments on the skate park. Uh, one from Mr. McLaughlin, uh, as long as it's grandfathered, I'd love to keep the park as it is. It took a lot of work for me and my friends to put it in. And then a uh, additional comment from Mr. Mossop, uh, uh, just saying if it's in disrepair, if it's safe and functional, keep it as it, as it is by all means. So. That should clear that. Any yeah, other comments? Sorry for that. I guess that was just a little bit of a back and forth there with, with me and Steve. I, and that was, uh, you know, nothing, uh, it, Steve, that was nothing as far as like, uh, you know, wanting to get rid of it or anything. My kids have been there to use it. I live a couple houses away there on Laurel. So, uh, you know, I see the, absolutely see the value in it. If you were part of the, uh, part of the group that, that put that facility in, thank you. But, um, you know, it, it was just more, uh, you know, I think clearing the air. And I, I think some of that, uh, sometimes the chat can be misconstrued, right? So, um, you know, not, nothing crazy there, dude. It's uh, it's all good. I, I absolutely see the value in it. Like I said, my, my son loves it over there and everything. So it's all good. All right. Any other public comment? This section of the meeting is now closed to the public correspondence. Mrs. Lohr. Yes. Oh, course. <clears throat> we have uh, a couple pieces. Uh, we received another uh, notice from uh, DOT. It is a freight grant, uh, a road improvement for freight. I don't think believe that applies to us. Harry, I'll defer to you on that regarding um, yeah, the only roads that, that would be applicable to that would be county roads. So right, but I did want to put on the uh, on the record and acknowledge that we received that. We also uh, received a letter from our resident Carol Hildebrand that she um, has resigned from the Historical Preservation Advisory Board. So that creates a, a vacancy uh, if that's accepted by Township Committee. That would create a vacancy. Um, on on the on that uh, historic preservation advisory board, and if the township committee wanted to move to move uh, people up from alternate positions, and then that would also create an alternate two spot for Alyssa uh, De La Pena that had applied uh, previously. Can we address that now, since you just read that, Janice? Because it is sure. it is the um, the wish of the history board to. Uh, except Carol's resignation, of course, the township would do that. Um, she's done a great job. She's been on the board for many years. But we would yeah. like to move Steve McLaughlin from the first alternate to fill Carol's unexpired seat. And then we would move Ron Naylor to fill Steve's unexpired seat as his first alternate. And then we would appoint Alyssa Gila Pena or to the board as the second alternate to fill Ron's unexpired seat. So that's what we would like to do and I would move to do that tonight. Is that a motion, uh, Ms. Fitzpatrick? Yeah. So it's a motion by Ms. Fitzpatrick to accept Ms. Hildebrand's letter of resignation 
move Steve McLaughlin to fill Carol Hildebrandon's unexpired term as a regular voting member, move Ron Naylor to the alternate number one position, previously occupied by Steve McLaughlin, and appoint Alyssa De La Pena to the alternate number two position, previously held by Ron Naylor. I'll second the motion. Okay. Mayor, would you like a roll call? Sure, please. Mr. Brown? Yes. Ms. Fitzpatrick? Yes. Ms. Holland? Yes. Mr. Olet? Yes. Mr. Templeton? Yes. And uh, just to uh, second uh, Kate's uh, mm -hmm. remarks, I uh, appreciate uh, the time and effort that uh, Carol Hildebrand has put into historic and uh, uh, all the other organizations that she continues to uh, volunteer her time for. So uh, with regrets, accept her resignation and, uh, and all the movement, uh, all the musical chairs on the historic board now, so. Yes, and is Mr. McLaughlin still logged in? Oh yes, I'm here. Uh, okay, so Mr. McLaughlin, you now are a regular voting member filling Carol Hildebrand's unexpired term, which by the way expires December 31st, 2020. So I would need, uh, a letter or just an email to me mm -hmm. uh, if you're interested in being reappointed. Sure. Okay. Uh, to a new no term. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Good. Okay. Thank you. It's an honor. Very good. Continuing correspondence. Uh, that's all the correspondence I have. Thank you, Mayor. There was a letter. Uh, I guess this from the for through the chief. Uh, the. Uh, one of our crossing guards uh, to retire. Did you want to? Okay, that's internal personnel. I usually do not enter those as correspondence, yeah. but we certainly can acknowledge that right. for the record that we have uh, one of our long time, long time crossing guards retiring this year. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Chief. I believe, I believe it's Linda Lewis. Yes. yes. We had two. Um, okay. Two long term crossing guards retire this year. Um, first was Irene Faust. She yep. retired in the midst of COVID, and uh, Linda Lewis is also retiring. Unfortunately, with these virtual virtual uh, committee meetings, uh, normally I would honor them at a township committee meeting, but um, you know, given given the circumstances, maybe uh, you know when we get back to normal uh, you know meetings. I can bring them back in and they can be recognized for yes. all the hard work they've done for us. And, and they've established some great uh, relationships with the school children. They do. Yes, thank you. All right, thank you, Chief. We miss them more than ever <laughs> at their earlier conference. I know, I know. I know, they've, they've been great. Uh, anything else, uh, Mrs. Laurel, on correspondence, you're done? I have no further correspondence, Mayor. Uh, status of coronavirus disease, uh, community impact update. Uh, uh, I had sent some memos uh, or an email to the uh, committee members and other uh, department heads and uh, uh, groups. Uh, there was a community uh, county health uh, conference call last week on Wednesday. And then on Thursday, there was one from the State Department of Health. Um, a lot of good information on the municipal website. The new uh, a county test site is at uh, Rowan College um, off Route 38. Uh, all that information, uh, dates, times, contact numbers is on the township website. It's also on the county health department website. Um, the uh, Department of Health uh, conference call on last Thursday, the uh, uh, New Jersey Health Commissioner, um, uh, Judith uh, Perichelli, uh, Great talk for about 45 minutes regarding a rollout plans for a uh, hopefully uh, developed uh, COVID vaccine. Uh, nothing is expected until late first quarter of 2021, and that will be an extremely limited uh, amount. Uh, but in, uh, as far as planning for the state, uh, they are hoping when sufficient production is produced in the country worldwide, uh, they're uh, 
embarking on a program and plan to vaccinate 70% uh, of the population in New Jersey over a six month period. Uh, that involves uh, approximately 70,000 shots uh, Monday through Friday for six months um, to get to that number. So it's, it's a huge undertaking and uh, a lot more information, but that was just the first initial call to uh, municipalities, uh, to the mayors and administrators and so forth. So um, there's some information that's going to be uh, gradually rolled out on the, on the state health department website, but uh, we're still a long way off from a COVID vaccine, but uh, we'll continue what we're doing and stay safe. Um, that's all I have. If anyone has any questions on, uh, on that or status of Halloween, trick or treating. Um, I looked at some of the surrounding towns on uh, Halloween and what they're doing and most towns have last year's or 2017 or 2016 uh, information on their municipal websites. So, so there's nothing new to report to uh, <laughs> Beverly or Edgewater or Delran or, or Riverside. Um, Mayor, the uh, a few minutes ago, the state just put out their Halloween guide. <laughs> we just got it online. I, I got one from the county online. It was on the PM. Uh, it was on the PM. The governor. What, what are they saying? Before Seven, I'm sorry, 7.09 p.m. Charlene Webster sent it to us. So He's got a lot, of, look at, a lot of stipulations on this. But yeah. it won't. Yeah. Looks like what you're talking about doing is exactly what they're suggesting, but you probably want to read it. Can't put your but it does talk about the signs. There were, Can't put candy in a bowl. Yeah, there were four options that if you were going to, if you're going to allow people, one option was to limit the interaction uh, or contact with trick-or-treaters, wear a mask when individuals come to your door and of course, wash your hands. The second one was a better option, leave a tree fall on a porch or table or in a place where it may be easily accessible uh, while adhering to social distancing requirements. And the third option was arrange individually packaged candy so that trick-or-treaters can grab and go without assessing a shared bowl. Um, and of course, there was a lot of other information, but they seem to be, uh, if anybody plans to trick-or-treat, they suggested limiting their groups to current family members, uh, consider staying local, and limit the number of houses on their route social distancing should be practiced at all times. That's what, it's like a three page document, but uh, that's what I kind of- Okay, read them number C, which is what was discussed. Uh, consider coordinating with neighbors to, neighbors to develop a system such as signs and or off porch lights for distinguishing houses, participating in trick or treating from those that do not wish to participate. Well, let's uh, let's deal with that. Um, one of the things uh, uh, that I asked uh, our administration, our, our creative staff up here, is to come up with a sign. And I think Janice had sent that out. Uh, yeah, Erin did that. Nice job. Erin made that up, and I did, <clears throat> did forward it to everyone today. Yeah. I have one too, Mayor. <laughs> oh. Hey. It's in color. Hers is in color. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Mine's in color. Yeah, mine's in color, too. So I, I uh, and that, uh, as far as uh, uh, the option that uh, we can put that on the, the website as a, as a downloadable PDF that people can print out and put in their door or window or uh, on their walkway in the, at a front gate or something like that. Uh, the other thing that was, uh, that's been suggested uh, is to cut back the trick or treat uh, uh, ending time to say 6 p.m. And uh, that way it's, uh, it's a Saturday uh, on Halloween and uh, uh, it would have that activity for those that wanna participate during daylight hours. And uh, it would uh, eliminate uh, things that go bump in the night. If people are doing, I think sunsets around 6.30 on the, 30, on the 31st. Um, and, and so I was wondering what kind of traction that idea had, but uh, I, I think it's, it's uh, something worthwhile to consider to, to 
to make the cutoff this year at 6 p.m. Uh, or any other suggestions to protect uh, protect our, our community. I think, Mayor, in our code trick-or-treating, there is already an established cutoff time at 8 p.m., so it's not like you're creating something new, you're just changing the time. Is that correct, Chief, that the trick-or-treating? Yeah, that's what... Cuts off as eight? Yeah, that's what the Chief recited. Yes, cuts off at eight by ordinance. I, I don't I don't think we should be uh, doing making these decisions uh, just like the townwide yard sale we you know we we promoted that and it it went on and people went out if they wanted to uh, there was a lot of traffic in town it wasn't the same as it always was but um, you know to cut it off at six versus eight I, I just necessary just you know let it happen the people trust the people they're gonna do um, you know, they're going to do what's responsible, you know, I don't know. I think we've wasted too much time on, on Halloween trick or treat. Uh, just let the families do what they want to do. You publish this uh, state thing that tells everyone what's the, their options. We certainly should put that on the website. Yeah. So that's not a, that's not a municipal decision maker that's aimed at individual right. families. Yeah. Well, the governor's been trumping us all along, you know, so you do what he says. <laughs> Richard, can you forward that to me and Ben? You got one. I'm sure you got it. Okay. I don't I see it. I checked I, my email. I didn't say it. Uh, All right. I can um I Jack, got it here I'll drop this you. off to you tomorrow because mine it's really nice the way I printed it. It's got a little spider on it, three pages, got an orange border. Yeah. So I'll drop it off to you. Okay, great. And then you can Yeah, I just email. emailed it. Okay. Terrific. Uh, <laughs> Is everyone okay with putting the uh, the uh, no trick or treat sign on the uh, town web website for people to uh, pull off yeah. and print? I yes. like that idea. I think that's a great idea. Yeah. And yes, we've we've got another meeting in two weeks. Uh, we'll see how things develop uh, in the area with our neighboring towns. Uh, I don't want to, you know, if, if if our neighbors for whatever decision they they go through process uh, uh, decide to shut down. I don't want to have a big overflow coming here and uh, uh, making things worse. But uh, is the church still going to have their night, um, the Methodist church, Kate? No, not to my knowledge. I haven't heard a thing. OK, so the kids will be around town then. Yeah. yeah. Right. And it, it would be so hard to have social distancing at behind the church because it even though it is a large area we had games and food giveaways and all I just and we had a tremendous amount of people coming so I don't know how we could possibly do it this year okay but I will definitely find out for sure by our next meeting okay any other um, comments on the uh, on trick-or-treating all right, we got another meeting to consider any changes or adjustments uh, in two weeks uh, before the holiday. So, uh, status of a uh, township committee meeting for October 19th. I think we've got a couple items of business to address. So, I guess we'll have it. I think it's a question do you want to stick with Zoom or hybrid or, you know, we keep doing Zoom till, we, till you tell us otherwise? Yes. Uh I know, I know the mayor sets the meetings, but uh, Janice, from what I understand, there are towns that are holding their meetings and their municipal buildings are open. Do we have a census on those? I'm sorry, what was the question? The question is, is that there are some towns in Burlington County that are holding their meetings. Um, their municipal buildings are open full time. Uh, do we have a census on those? Can we get that information anywhere? I can send out a blast to the uh, clerks in the county. It's kind of, from what I'm hearing, it's kind of a, you know, some are in person, some are a hybrid, some are completely, Zoom, you know, um, on the remote platform, um, just like being open to the public. Some towns are fully open to the public, some are a few days as we are, and some have not opened to the public yet. You cannot, not, services are very limited still. So it's all over the place, but I'll do an official poll through the for the through the clerks association. Sure. But Janice, I had a question too. Are are we um, if we do meet in public, 
Do we also have to provide a call-in service like we did at that one meeting? If you're offering a hybrid <clears throat> in person and let's say the Zoom platform also, as we did, you know, tried that one time, yes, you, you must have, you have to offer the um, chat option, the- um, Do we have uh, to, if we have a public meeting in the municipal building, do we have to do both? No. Okay. Well, it depends but, on however, spacing. Remember, explain right. that. Yeah, yeah. explain exactly. the rule on that. I'm just ready to do that. Thank you. The, the, the new law requires that if we go with just in person, we have to accommodate everyone who shows up. And if we do not, and we still have to maintain social distancing requirements. So if we do not have enough space in our courtroom to accommodate everyone, and keep everyone social distance at six foot, we have to find a bigger facility. Okay. That's in the law. So like tonight we have 10 people that are would, would have been attending the meeting. Would we have had enough space for all 10 of those folks? Uh, just barely. If um, there is there, I think there are 10 seats. Yeah, but you know, with Township Committee and Township Committee is going to take some of those lower seats also and our professionals because we can only put five up on the dais. Then we have committee members sitting down below and our professional staff, uh, and then the remainder for the public. It would have been tight. We may have gotten everybody in that wanted to attend in person, but um, you know, we uh, you have to be very careful because the law is very specific about, you can't turn anyone away because we're full. So would we continue to have, um, like if, if everyone wanted to do an in-person one with the hybrid option for the 19th, if, we're having a bad outbreak at work. We're up to 17 positives. Ooh. So like, I wouldn't feel comfortable being around you guys because I feel like I'm potentially your super spreader. Um, so would I be able to call in remotely? I would hate to expose somebody unknowingly. Yes, you would. Yeah. And yes, you could still do a remote um, attendance. Absolutely. Just to, but, to chime in for a second, what I've seen yeah. actually is a lot of the public entities half of the governing body or half for the board when they do a a a uh, approach with part live part uh, remote is half the board or half the governing body actually intentionally stays home um, to create more space in the public seating area for the public to attend uh, i gotta say i've done zoom i've done regular public meetings and I've done the dual approach and the most difficult one is the dual approach. Mm, yeah. It's just a lot of back and forth. And it's, it's, it's particularly hard. I think sometimes when conversation is taking a place live in a room to make sure that the people who are remotely attending are included at the same level. Um, it's just a natural way conversation occurs sometimes. And, and it, especially at board proceedings, I've seen it, it's, it's difficult. I just wonder why, how the school board can have an in-person meeting without, without remote access. I don't know how they can do it if we can't do it. Do they have to provide the same, um, mm -hmm. They do, and they may have a backup. I don't know what their plan is, but I can tell you that in one of our towns, we have a regular meeting, but if we hit our limit, we have a process in place with a, with a remote platform that will go into effect and allow additional people to attend. But we've got to stop and wait and give people time to go back, get on that platform. It's, it's not ideal, but it's the best we can do under the circumstances. Yeah, maybe they have more space at the school. I don't know. I don't know, but I know they have a meeting coming up and it's in person and it's not hybrid. We have a, a comment from a resident on this issue um, saying as a resident with children, I would greatly appreciate a continued online option. Yeah. All right. Um, so we'll zoom on the 19th. Uh, Discussion item, structural report for 200 ASH. 
this has been carried forward. Uh, we've had Mr. Fox's uh, engineering report on 200 ash, which is in the agenda packet. Uh, um, the report gives us uh, some time and space to think about uh, this property. Uh, fortunately, in, in one way that there isn't anything, uh, uh, there wasn't a fatal flaw found that something needs to be done or pushes us to a decision to uh, bring the building down. Uh, we do have a question uh, that needs to be answered as far as trying to, uh, I guess, weather tight or weatherproof part of the roof structure. Um, and uh, I guess uh, continue uh, to ponder what, uh, what we view as the destiny for that property or, or the building and or the building together. So uh, Mr. Schwab, do you have any, any comments or Mr. Heinhold, uh, we had a, an email discussion about that uh, last week or so, so. Yeah. I only mentioned that uh, John Fenimore has been doing more cleanup. He points out that there is zero space between the fence and the side of the building, uh, which, which we were talking about trying to get up there to seal the upper areas and and so on, because uh, we were talking about getting rid of trees, yeah. uh, doing things to make the site less risky while you're going through whatever process. Uh, but I, I guess the key thing I think about is what your process is going to be and how long it's going to take. Yeah. How you anticipate thinking about options and getting public input on those options and costing them out. And, you know, if you're giving yourself six months or a year to do that, then is it just going to happen by osmosis? Or are you going to assign someone to put that together? Uh, how are you going to get input and so on? I don't know if anyone's thought that through yet. What is the, Doug, do you have any any comment? Uh, I know we've yeah, just got a, a long range clock that we have to worry about. Um, yeah. So I think we, we've talked about this a little bit um, leading up to the purchase, which is I think it was um, really wise of the town to step in and acquire the property uh, because of potential issues that could come from that site if not under township control. I think the, the longer term issue of what, whether to demolish the building or whether to consider um, maintaining it, uh, one of the things I would suggest is two things really. One is whatever calculation is run should not just be the cost of getting from point A to point B, but then the main, annual maintenance of that going forward. And I think when we dealt with the mansion, again, it was imperative that the town step in in that situation and do what was done. Um, but, but the reality of that after a few years was the annual maintenance of the, of the property was just um, not maintained, something that uh, could not be maintained by uh, our township. And I've seen that, we've talked about this again, I've seen that many, many times that the cost of maintaining older properties is, is high. And then um, it's, I hate to, to remind everyone, but 2025 is, is not that long away. Uh, um, and that is when the next round of affordable housing comes. So it's something where I'd want to, if we were going to maintain that building, we can't have it just sitting available for any public use. It has to have a dedicated use. Um, otherwise, there's going to be pressure to turn it over to affordable housing. And I think one of the concerns we talked about when we acquired the property is to not have an apartment building there because it's not really, that area of town is just not set up to accommodate it. That lot can't you know, accommodate the parking and the area around it can't accommodate it. It's pretty evident that it's gonna come down. Um, yeah. The cost of uh, you know, re rehabbing it and the cost of uh, you know, redesigning it into something uh, and then the annual maintenance cost, this little town of 4,000 people, I don't think can really, uh, you know, afford to do that. So is it just a matter of uh, somebody moving on or making a motion that we, you know, move to demolish the building? Um, I know I had said at one point, 
that I would like the public's input, but uh, you know, the more public that I speak to, you know, privately or on the street, and it's not a whole lot, but uh, you know, most people think we're putting a park there and they're okay with it. Um, I think, uh, I think I heard one comment that it'd be a nice uh, community center from somebody with, within the circle of the municipality, maybe HPAP or uh, Peter's group. I, I'm not sure, but uh, where are we at with moving on making that decision? Well, one of the things that, that, that constantly comes up, with, as John says, is a community center, or, you know, meeting space for various uh, community groups, uh, dedicated uh, home for, for, for all those. And uh, I thought something that would drive home the reality of what Doug was talking about, the expense of uh, rehabbing that building into something that's publicly accessible, ADA compliant, all that stuff, all the new uh, code. Uh, and then, you know, uh, annual maintenance and being able to support that as, as uh, John has spoken to. And if you come up with, okay, this town, Palmyra did this, building a brand new um, uh, rec, you know, community center or another town that did something else with an old building in Nova Town. If you look at, okay, it cost them, you know, $3 million to do this or $5 million to do that. And it costs them, you know, $180,000 a year to maintain it. Those real dollars and real, you know, figures in black and white on your budget start to strike home. And uh, as John says, and, and I think other others on the committee agree that uh, um, things are expensive. And I think uh, if we get some hard numbers, uh, and it doesn't have to be a, a deep dive on it, uh, you know, uh, but uh, you know, when, when we're, someone comes up and said, oh, it'd be a wonderful community center or, you know, earlier in the meeting, someone's going, kids don't have anything to do. Well, <laughs> if you've got, you know, hit the lottery and you got six, you know, a couple million dollars, um, that's, that's, a, that's a big reach for, for this size community. So, um, and it, I think would help the argument that if, uh, if we do move in that direction to bring the building down, you can say we can't afford it in a nutshell. We, we tried, we tried with the old municipal building. Mm -hmm. We couldn't afford to upgrade that. We, we protected the Lanco by purchasing the mansion so that uh, we had hoped that maybe we could maintain it, but we couldn't, but we preserved it. It's a jewel in the town. We're lucky to have it. Uh, and the townhouses that are around it have not hurt the look or the aesthetics of the mansion. So it was a good thing that we did there. But this particular property, there, this is in worse condition than the old municipal building or the mansion. And it would cost us a lot more to bring it up to code to make it accessible for any public use in my mind. And I understand that people would love to have a recreation center. Then we would also have to employ someone to be there so that it would be open. I've had someone say, we should have the library there. We should have a rec center. We should have uh, all these different things. but. In the, in the end, I think we're gonna to have to demolish it. And then, or right now, set up a subcommittee to talk to the county, to talk to uh, Rancocas um, Pathways, the Rancocas Trail, and see if they would work with us to, would they be interested in helping us maintain a community park there that would be accessible for everybody. Then we could put it on green acres possibly so that it isn't subject to affordable housing. I think that's one of the reasons, that was one of the reasons why I was interested in, in our purchase of it 
because rumor had it that a developer was going to buy it and put affordable housing there. And right now we don't need any more affordable housing. So I say move forward. If you want to get a subcommittee together, get a subcommittee. And I think John Brown should definitely be on it because he sort of eyeballed this and started the ball rolling and see if we can get some partners to make a decision on what we're going to do with it. My, I'm Go sorry. ahead, Fern. In my opinion, uh, even if we talked about putting a recreation center or some activity or some building there, that building's got to come down. It does. Let's spend the money, get it down to the ground. If we want to explore um, putting something else, we're better off uh, going with new construction there exactly. uh, that'll meet the codes, et cetera. But uh, my personal feeling is that it's on the, um, between Pennington Park and Amico Island, um, the county's got the, uh, I guess the walkway or the trail going uh, going through there and it goes right by that piece of ground. Uh, if we get the county involved with it, uh, they've already got the park rangers. We make it into a park. We have access to the creek or the public has access to the creek uh, and the county's in the position to uh, oversee the park with their uh, their staff that they already having traveling through uh, through the town, um, you know they could open it up in the morning and close it up at night. Uh, so that's my thought about the building at this point. Well, John uh, Fern, do you want to? Uh, and anybody else want to be a, a or do you two want to work on? Uh, Contact and uh, talking with the county and see if they'd be interested in a in a partnership for moving that towards a, uh, a public a public uh, public park. Yeah, we could uh, we could definitely reach out to uh, Mary Pat or Matt Johnson because the property next to it is also um, going to be available. From what I understand, I spoke to friends of the owners. Uh, I, you know, I think they want out of there, but I don't think we can afford to, you know, grab both. But uh, with partnership from the county, perhaps maybe, um, you know, uh, that's possible. It, it, like Fern said, that county trail has been hired out. They uh, hired a contractor to start that work. Yeah. So they're going to improve that uh, entire run. Yeah. Um, so, so why would I, we want? I mean, yeah. Well, why would we want to spend I'm really money? comfortable with moving on, on demolishing the building. I, I don't have any regrets. Uh, I've been in the building. Mike, you've been in the building. Uh, Fern, you've been in there. Uh, just It's so scary, the fact that elevators would be needed for three stories. And let me tell you, that would be an expense in itself. Yeah. Uh, windows in every single uh, floor. And um, yeah, take a look at page 14 of uh, Perry's report. Structural work, 120, 150, 130 extra for windows and miscellaneous. That's before you do any improvements. Yeah. Uh, construction, structural, just a minimum, seven to 90,000 if you're going to just sit it there for 10 years. And between 85, 105 for demolition. Yeah. yeah. I, listen, I agree, Fern. It, it's cheaper to put up a new building than to rehab an old building. Uh, especially for a rec center where you only need one floor. Uh, that way you don't need elevators, uh, but you can't do one floor there because you have to go up eight feet yeah. uh, because of the floodplain. So you, you need to stilt anything up there. So what do you I say we or... with the park world, you know, take it down and then start uh, getting involved with uh, rec and the county and, um, you know, design a nice little pocket park there. And um, you know maybe expand. We had a county trail system going away to Pennington, yeah. and Jesse kind of gave us some nice uh, news that there's another property owner in Hulk Island uh, um, questioning his validity of ownership. Uh, so we're on the right move to uh, make our parks. Well, do you, uh, uh, you and Fern or uh, Chris uh, or Kate, any two of you want to? Uh, I'm I'm game. Oh what are we going to do? Though? What's 
what, what's our purpose? Well, I think we should demolish it first. Why spend any more money? Why, why would we spend $80,000 to seal it up when it's going to come down? That's that's not the question. I, I want to try to get get two two committee members that are going to start trying to cultivate a partnership with the county. I th think we still have some environmental issues that need to be sorted out for the property. And if I recollect correctly, uh, Harry said that there's some uh, asbestos uh, remediation that has to come out of the building in any case, whether it stays or goes. Right. So there's a couple steps there that have to be accomplished first. Uh, All right, but while that's still going on, uh, John and I can reach out to the county and uh, yes. start planting the seeds and yes. see if we can get any movement. Yeah. Yeah. Let's see what uh, the reaction. Doing that, I would reach out to Rancocas Pathways because I do have a rapport with John Anderson, and I would like to reach out to him separately to see what they would have in, an interest in. Because Peter did um, put up a chat here that um, they tried to work towards creek access at Pennington, and the Parks Department has not been open to creek access. And of course, that's, so that's kind of a bad site. Uh, yeah, so maybe so maybe I would reach out to him and see what we could do, and you two can reach out to the county. Okay. Okay. I'm okay with that, Kate. If you have a report with them, yeah, reach out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I do. And so does yeah, relationships are important, so yes. Yeah. Okay, and I'll be in touch with you on what we can do. Maybe we okay. can Thanks, Sean. meeting, and uh, we'll talk about convenient times. All right. Uh, Richard, or, I don't know if Harry's yeah. still there. If, uh, yeah. There was so we're headed towards demolition. We'll get the asbestos work done. We've yeah. got to get the uh, remediation, environmental remediation done, but we won't waste any time or money on sealing up with the assumption that we'll be moving towards demolition as soon as it's feasible. Yeah, Does everyone agree with that? Yes. Yes. Harry? Yeah, the, the asbestos would be done as part of the demolition. Oh, that's right. De you demolish it. People just to do it together, the asbestos and, and demolition together. Okay. That would be obviously a bid job, correct? The demo. Correct. Yeah. Did, did, do you want uh, Harry to yes. make a uh, engineering proposal for the demolition? Is it, yeah. is it a, a bid right. if it's an emergency uh, demolition? Due it's to not an emergency. He already reviewed it and indicated it's not an emergency. Yeah, it doesn't qualify. Okay. Might as well. Let's get let's get some numbers. All right. We'll get that and that'll be the next point of discussion. Once you approve that, then you know you're headed towards demolition. And if you want to get any public comment, you have All right. still have time for that. All right. Anybody have any uh, comments on that is on this uh, course of action? All right. All right. Because we did appropriate the money. Money's there right. for the demolition. But it was the decision making, like John was saying, whether there's some commitment to the to have some public process first. Okay. Um, I think Mike, that, if I could be of any help with that, uh, I was with uh, John Anderson when we uh, looked at creek access. Uh, points in town and all right. I, I have some insights to you know what okay. was happening. All right. Thank you, Peter. Sure. Uh, that completes the uh, the public agenda. And I believe we've got a couple short items to discuss in the executive. Uh, if yes. anyone has any uh, last comments there, then they need a resolution to go into executive session. And it'll be resolution um, 122 for executive session, attorney clients and um, land real estate matters. Okay. okay. I'll make a motion for uh, resolution 122. I'll second. Second. I need a roll call. Hi, you members of the public, thank you for attending. Okay, I'm just gonna do a quick roll call on that resolution, Mr. Brown? Yes. Mrs. Fitzpatrick? Yes. Ms. Holland? Yes. Mr. Olatz? Yes. And Mr. Templeton? Yes, thank you. Thank you. And I'm going to ask uh, Aaron Provenzano to, uh, as we move into executive session to discuss uh, one of the Zoom features for a, Aaron, what was that called again? It's called a breakout room. Hmm. Um, so we do still have some members of the public that are online. 
if you guys would like to go into executive meeting, I can break you out. You can discuss your, uh, whatever you want to discuss privately, and then we can bring you back in after you, your discussion is over. Hey. You want to try that function, the breakout? How do we do that? So I'm going to, if you give me a minute, you guys will get an invite to join the breakout room. Just uh, I'm going to put you on hold for it. Okay, I'm, I'm going to say good night. Yeah. Hey, thanks, Harry. Good job, Harry. Thank you. Oh, Harry, Harry, real, real quick, while Aaron's setting up this, the executive session, um, the, re the past resolution for the change order, um, does that have to go to Mary Pat Robbie, or did you already send that? Uh, no, that, that'll be a change order to our contract. She doesn't need that. Even though it was a municipal park grant, they don't need to see that change order? No, I'll, I'll communicate well, with they her. Will. Okay. I'll yeah. communicate with her. Okay, thank Diff you. Different than CDBG. You know, we got burned <laughs> on that CDBG one because yeah. they didn't get copy yeah. of the change order. Mary Pat operates yeah, very remember, different than CDBG. Yeah. And um, also to uh, Township Committee, um, because of, air, um, I've asked Kitty, and if it's okay, I've asked Kitty Martin to stay for executive session as well as um, Aaron Provenzano, Erin, uh, because she is the, running this meeting, the technical aspect of it. And also too, I think on one or two of the things that Doug will be talking about, she may be able to add some insight as well as um, um, Kitty, because we have been doing some research on a couple of the issues. So if that's okay, I would like, um, yes. I need Aaron to stay in. And I don't think anything so sensitive that these two, oh employees are already very familiar with these issues and have been helping with the research Good. on that. Join breakout room. Join. You say join. Is everybody getting up? Everybody receiving. The breakout room. Every yes. So hit join. Yes. Okay, I'm just waiting for Kate. Uh, I wonder if because she doesn't have the option of a video, can she not see the request to join? Oh, there she, wait, I do see her. Okay, everybody is now in the breakout room. Can you all hear me? 